Hello everyone this is part 9 of what if Naruto left Kanoa and awakens lava and boil release, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down below. The letter from Kanoa our decoders have already decoded it. The rakage took the letter and began to read it. After a few minutes he finished reading the letter and smiled. Is it what you expected? Asked Nano. Yes it is, replied the rakage. Nano, send a reply to Kanoa telling them that I will come to Kanoa in six days time and contact Mitsuhide Sensei, Sayuri Sensei, Juj Liang Sensei tell them I will need them to accompany me there along with Killer B and Yugito, since Fu is in Takagakur with Shibuki and Okatsu is on a intel gathering mission for me. Also inform Anasu I will be leaving him in charge once I leave. At this Nano smirked a little, you know he won't like that. At that this the rakage smirked back, yeah I know, but I make it up to him later. At this Nano smiled a little before she became serious, are you sure you want to go there, what if, said Nano but was stopped when the rakage raised his hand. I will be fine, Kanoa isn't that stupid to try something against me, the desperate and they can't afford having us as their enemy, so they won't try anything, replied the rakage. But what Abu, said Nano but was stopped again by the rakage. I will be fine I promise, he said with a smile, where Nano nodded her head and then left the office to do what the rakage had asked her to do. Once she left the rakage turned around to look out the window to see the sun setting, as he always enjoyed watching the sunset and seeing all the different colors you would see when it did. As he looked out he could not help but smile. All according to plan, he thought. Six days later at Kanoa main gate. At the main gate of Kanoa stood Sunid, Jiraiya, Shizun, the Anbu commander, the Shinobi elders Danzo, Homura and Koharu along with the majority of the Kanoa eleven and the three dozen of Kanoa's Anbu, Chunans and Jonans. They were there awaiting the arrival of the rakage and his entourage, they had received the rakage reply about four days ago and were quite surprised that the rakage agreed to come to Kanoa himself. They had expected that he would either send an ambassador to Kanoa or to Metsunid in a neutral location like Tetsu no Kuni Iron Country. It seems that the rakage is late, spoke Homaru, as there had yet to be a sign of him coming or word from their scouts that he was near. Are you certain of the time he sent, he asked Sunid. Yes I, am, he might be delayed for some reason, replied Sunid. Or he was attacked by assassins, said Koharu, since it would not be out of the question for someone to try and assassinate the cage of another village. Do you think that Orokimaru and his allies found out about the talks with the rakage and sent assassins to take out the rakage and his entourage so to stop the talks, suggested the Anbu commander. No I don't think so, Orokimaru would wait at least until the talks were over to see if new Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance would join us or not, since if he sent assassins to try and kill the rakage before the talks even started. Then new Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance would declare war on him and then the Heavenly Alliance would ally with us, which something I sure he wants to avoid, said Sunid. After a few more minutes of waiting Kiba suddenly spoke up, hey guys do any of you hear some kind of large humming sound? After hearing Kiba everyone started to listen to try and hear the sound for themselves, for a few minutes none of them heard anything but soon enough they started to hear it as well as it grew louder and louder. After which Konohamaru suddenly pointed up to the sky looking up and shouted out, hey guys look up there. When they did the Sorakumo airship, as it came closer they were able to get a better look of the airship, it differed from the one that they saw on Jirai's recording. For one thing it had a large golden falcon's head in front of it instead of a bronze dragon's head like the other airship. Not only that but once it was over the village the true scope of its size came into view, where it was easily twice the size and length of the other Kumo airship. 1. When the greeting party saw the airship they could not help but be all in awe of it in its design and size, as this was their first time any of them seeing a Kumo airship with their own two eyes. It huge, said Kiba in awe, whose comment, was shared by everyone around, they also saw that the airship was accompanied by 20 Skyhawk ninjas, who flew around the airship. As the airship flew over Kanoa, everyone in the village looked up in awe at the sight of the airship as this was the first time anything like this had ever been seen in Kanoa. The airship then started to head to the Hockage Monument. Where is it going? asked Eno. It must be going to land on the Hockage Monument as it's the only place it can really land, said Jiraiya. 
Quickly the greeting party ran towards the Hockage Monument, after a few minutes of racing at top speed they were able to make it to the top of the Hockage Monument just before the airship landed. As the massive airship came nearer to the ground the Skyhawk ninjas flew down to the ground, where they flicked a small switch on their harnesses to have the wings fold up on their backs. As the airship neared the ground the crew of the airship dropped down harness ropes to the Skyhawk ninjas on the ground from the catwalk. Once they Skyhawk ninjas had got the ropes the help to lower the ship down and nail the ropes to the ground so that it would land on the spot it needed to and stay there. After the airship had landed on the ground a ramp started to lower down from the right hand side of the ship, which was right in front of the greeting party. After the ramp reached the ground the Skyhawk ninja fell into line at the end of the ramp as a guard of honor with 10 on one side and another 10 on the other side. Once the Skyhawk ninja were in line, two large doors opened up on the side of the ship to reveal eight storm nins who positioned themselves along either side of the ramp as a guard of honor. Much like what the Skyhawk ninjas did with four storm nins on one side and another four on the other. After the storm nins fell into position the Rakage himself appeared dressed in his official cage uniform, with his yellow cage hat and yellow and white robes as well as his mask that covered the lower portion of his face. Along with him were two of his bodyguards Ni Yugito and Killer B as well as three other new faces, who when some of the Kanoa members saw them were shocked beyond words. Akechi Mitsuhide, said Shino in a surprised monotone voice, or as surprised as a monotone voice can sound where he rose one of his eyebrows. And Mayoshi Sayuri, said Kiba with surprise, as he was just as surprised as Shino was. Who, asked Konohamaru as he was not familiar with either of them. The man in white is Akechi Mitsuhide also known as Shiro Takai no Kiri, Mist's White Death, formerly of Kirigaku or Hidden Mist. He was the former head of Kiri's Oinan division, which he became when he was only 13, he was also a former member of the Kiri no Shinobagatana Nananenshu, seven ninja swordsmen of the Mist which he became when he was 15. He is also currently the last remaining member of the Akechi clan as well as the last remaining wielder of the clan's bloodline the Takagan, Hawkeye, which allows its wielder to see great distances, keep up with great speeds, see through Genjustu and see through objects. Much like the Byakugan and the Sharingan it also allows the user to hit any object with 99.99% accuracy no matter how small or how far the object as well as several other abilities. He is wanted for single-handedly killing 300 bloodline hunters, which was nearly the entire bloodline hunter division, in a single night after which he was given the rank of an S-class missing nin from Kiri with an engage with caution warning on him, spoke Shino. And the redhead is Mayoshi Sayuri also known as Kiri no Shinkutakai Crimson Death of Mist, formerly of Kirigakur, Hidden Mist, as well and former teammate of Akechi Mitsuhide, she also a former member of the Kiri no Shinobagatana Nananan Shu like Akechi Mitsuhide. She is also the last surviving member of the Mayoshi clan and wielder of the clan's bloodline the Shaitai Kiri Kitai, the mist body vapor which allows her to turn her body into a mist-like vapor which allows them to enter almost any enemy stronghold without difficulty and allows her to do a few other things as well. She wanted by Kiri for killing the entire Kiri council who supported the Yodai Mizukaj slaughter of bloodline users and had ordered her clan's massacre and was given the rank of an A-rank missing nin with an engaged with caution warning on her like Akechi Mitsuhide, said Kiba. Whoa, said Konohamaru as he didn't expect to hear that, so these guys are pretty tough then. Extremely, replied Shino. But then who the guy in the robes with the fan? He looks like some kind of pansy noble to me, joked Konohamaru although he joking quickly ended when he saw Jiraiya and Sunid giving him serious looks that told him it wasn't funny. Not to mention he saw the worried looks that Homura and Koharu had and the concerned look on Danzo's usual neutral face when he looked at the man in robes. I would not be making any jokes like that Konohamaru, if I were you, especially with Juj Liang, said Sunid in a serious tone and look on her face. Who is he, sensei? I've never heard of him, asked Sakura. Few have, since he usually keeps to himself in his mountain retreat, and he rarely involves himself with other nations or people. Sunid and I met him once before when he was 15 and he was already highly skilled and talented boy at the time, where he was traveling from one place to another, learning as much as he could, said Jiraiya. How powerful is he? asked Joji. From all the things I heard about him over the years in terms of power Juj Liang is as powerful as Sensei was, back when he was in his prime, answered Jiraiya. He is as powerful as Oji San was, said Konohamaru in shock and disbelief as he knew that he grandfather was once one of the strongest shinobis in the elemental continent.
When he was in his prime, if not the strongest and was also the strongest Hokage to have live, second only to the Yondime Hokage himself. Maybe even stronger, said Jiraiya, shocking the Kanoa Eleven, from what I heard over the years about him, he knows and has mastered thousands of jutsus and is able to combine them effectively to make them more powerful just as Sensei was able to do. He's also a master genjutsu user, and a master in the art of sealing where he is at my level in it, not to mention a master strategist where many shinobi villages, rulers of other nations had often tried to have him under their employment so to command their armies. But he refused them all as he had no interest in joining any nation of shinobi village, and only helped out those he deemed worthy of helping, after which he would then go back to his mountain retreat, said Jirai further shocking the group. He's that powerful, said a stunned Sakura to which Jiraiya nodded. He is, dot and he is also known as the Namoriru of the Sleeping Dragon. Why is that? asked Eno. Well you know the old saying, that you should never wake a sleeping dragon, for if you do he will utterly destroy you, said Jiraiya to which the others nodded to knowing the old saying. Well the saying can be said for him in a way, where if anyone is stupid enough to challenge or anger Juj Liang then he would completely and utterly destroy you leaving no trace of you left on the earth, spoke Jiraiya, which caused many of the Kanoa Eleven to look on worriedly at Juj Liang as he, the rakage and the others came closer to them. Troublesome, said Shikamaru, so if this guy was just a ronin ninja, who wasn't with any shinobi village or clan and wasn't interested in joining any of them. Then how did New Kumo get him to join them? That's the million Ryo question, said Jiraiya, as he then looked over at Mitsuhide and Sayuri. Those two must be Kumo no Shirotaka, White Falcon of Cloud, and Shinkukiri no Kumo, Cloud's Crimson Mist. As they match the description I got about them. Not to mention their aliases are kinds of a giveaway considering their abilities, thought Jiraiya as he was familiar with both their reputations both from being with Kiri and now with New Kumo. When the rakage neared the Kanoa group, where like with the Kanoa Eleven and their senseis at the Battle of Wave, Suand, Jiraiya and the others there could practically feel the aura of dominate authoritative power coming from the rakage which he was become infamous for which made nearly made everyone submissive to his presence. Both Jiraiya and Suand along with the shinobi elders had to fight hard to fight the submissive urges they were having from the rakage and to remain unaffected to it. As he came closer they could also feel the powerful essence about him which Kakashi, Kurenai and the others described which made everyone around him, including Sunid, Jiraiya and the shinobi elders feel a combination of fear and respect for the rakage. Damn, so this is the rakage now I see what Kakashi and the brats were talking about, thought Jiraiya as he fought of the urge to shiver slightly in the rakage presence as he had never felt anything like it before. It was made even worse when he looked into the rakage's cold but bright blue eyes that seemed so familiar to him and reminding him of someone, yet as he looked in them he could feel the intensity and power of the rakage from them. On behalf of Kanoa and its people and would like to greet you rakage-san to our humble village, it is an honor to have you here and to finally meet you in person. I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation for talks for a possible alliance between your village and the heavenly alliance with our own. I would also like to thank you myself for saving our shinobis during your attack on the hold and for saving our shinobis again at Nami no Kuni, even though I know that that it was simply because they were in a situation that just happened to concern you, spoke Sunid respectfully. You're welcome Hokage San and I was pleased to receive your invitation as the Heavenly Alliance is always pleased to have new members or allies joining it, spoke the Rakage respectfully. I'm pleased to hear this, said Sunid, although we were surprised that we agreed to visit us here in our home village and the way came here, where Sunid the looked up at the rakage airship. Ah, yes, well I thought it best that we have these talks soon due to your war and thought it best you stay in your village in case your enemies tried to assassinate you, when you are left your village to meet me in a neutral location. Also traveling by airship to here was much faster than walking here and more secure, replied the rakage. Then I thank you for your consideration to our plight, replied Sunid. The rakage nodded, before her turn to his companions, as many of you may already be familiar with. Allow me to introduce you to my companions, my personal bodyguards Ni Yugito and, said the rakage, but before he could finish speaking he was interrupted by Killer Bee. I float like a butterfly. And sting like a bee. I kill a bee and I'm here to say thuf spoke Killer Bee before Yugito bashed him on his head causing a very large lump to appear on his head. Shut it you idiot, this isn't time or the place for your stupid bad rhymes, said Yugito angrily. Don't hate the player hate the game, replied Killer Bee, but wisely shut up when he saw the glare Yugito gave him. 
all the while everyone around them had large sweat drops on the back of their heads at the antics of the two, while the rakage just chuckled as he was used to all this and it always made him laugh. Please forgive B-san he sometimes gets carried away when he introduces himself to people, said the amused rakage. That quite all right rakage san there are certain shinobis here that are like that as well, said Sunid as she thought how Lee and Guy act at times. The rakage just nodded before he turned to the others in his group, now then, as I was saying, allow me to also introduce you to my senseis who some of your shinobis would be familiar with. Akechi Mitsuhide and Mayoshi Sayuri and my other sensei Juj Liang, who I believe you and Jiraiya-san are already acquitted with Hokage-san, spoke the rakage. This revelation of course is shocked many of the Konoha group, the rakage was the student of two high-ranked Kiri missing nins and the student of the legendary Namoriru. Now it makes sense why Juj Liang joined New Kumo, his student is the rakage and he must have somehow convinced Juj Liang to join him, thought Jiraiya. Not to mention it answered his question who designed the large-scale Kuan absorption seal, since he doubted that the other two could have designed it. As only a master sealer on the level of himself or higher level master would be able to create something like that. Greeting Sunid San and Jiraiya San it has been many years, you are both looking well I see, spoke Juj Liang in a polite tone of voice. Same can be said for you Juj Liang, it is good to see you as well, you have grown quite a bit since we last saw you, said Jiraiya with a smile. Thank you, said Juj Liang. After which the rakage greeted most of the Kanoa Eleven in the similar manner that he had greeted them at Nami no Kuni. Once he had greeted them Sunid, introduced the Shinobi Elders, where the rakage greeted them neutrally, but still with some small respect. After the introductions were all done, Sunid suggested that they go to the council room and began the possible alliance talks, which the rakage agreed to, where he Yugito, B, Juj Liang, Mitsuhide, Sayuri and the two storm teams accompanied the Kanoa party to the council room in the Hokage Tower. As the groups head off the Skyhawk ninjas along with several other Kumo shinobis who were also on the airship took up guarded position around the airships. Also at the same time on the other side of the airship directly behind the ramp and doorway of the airship, four Kumo bolt nins, wearing their black and red anbu masks passed right through the metal walls of the side of the airship. Where they then quickly disappeared before anyone could see them. In the Kanoa council room the trip to the council room was uneventful for the rakage and his entourage, that is if you don't count the large numbers of Kanoa shinobis, from Jenin to Jonin and Kanoa civilians from child to the adult. Who had been lining up to see the famed rakage aka Kami no Raiden, god of thunder and lightning and get a look at him and his entourage. The rakage and his party for their part ignored the people's stares and just continued on until they reached the council room door, where the two storms teams along with most of the Kanoa Eleven and other Kanoa ninjas stayed outside the council room door. While the rakage and the others, entered the council room, where the remainder of the Kanoa council were waiting for them. When the rakage entered the council room he took a seat that was placed for him facing the Sunid, the council and Jiraiya who stood behind Sunid. When the rakage took his seat Yugito, B, Juj Liang, Mitsuhide, Sayuri stood behind their cage. Now that the rakage and his delegation have arrived we shall begin the talks for a possible alliance better, spoke Sunid before the rakage spoke up and interrupted her. Forgive my interruption Hokage San, but if I may, I would like to say something before the talks can begin, spoke the rakage. Naturally Sunid had been taken off guard by the rakage interruption, but quickly regained herself and allowed the rakage to speak, which the rakage nodded his thanks to her. Honored Hokage and members of the Kanoa Council as all of you are well aware nearly 20 years ago, my village orchestrated a plot to kidnap Lady Hanata of the Huga clan when she was only three years old. Where they had planned to bring Lady Hanata back to Kumo and use her to found a Huga clan in Kumo, and use the Huga clan's Byakugan to strengthen Kumo and as you all know the plan failed, spoke the rakage. When the rakage said this, Hanata's stomach turned slightly as she did not like remembering that night, since she had come very close to becoming a human breeding machine for Kumo, which made her sick to her stomach at the very thought of it. Quickly forcing the memory away Hanata focused on what the rakage was saying. This resulted in the death of the head ninja, who was sent to Kanoa and had been the one who attempted to kidnap Lady Hanata. When this happened my predecessor the Yondaim Rakage further shamed himself and our village by demanding the head of Huga Hyashi as compensation, or risk breaking the peace treaty and start a war between Kumo and Kanoa. 
This in turn resulted in the death of Hugo Hyashi younger brother Hugo Hizashi who nobly gave up his life to keep the peace and save lives by acting as his brother's body double, said the rakage sadly. Where he then looked over to Hanata, she lowered her head at the loss of her uncle which was why she and Neji had such a strong dislike and distrust of Kumo. And although I have apologized on behalf of my village to Lady Hanata and her cousin Hugo Neji for the regrettable incident, that my village and my predecessor the Yondime Rakage caused. For although I greatly respect and admire the Yondime Rakage, for not only was he a powerful and great cage who loved his village and did whatever was necessary to protect Kumo and its people, I do not agree with some of the beliefs he had, nor some of the actions he took during his reign as the Yondime Rakage. Hence I still feel I must apologize again and try and at least make amends. Hence I present these tokens to Lady Hanata and her clan in the hope of making amends for the mistakes of my village and my predecessor, spoke the Rakage. As he then signaled to Yugito, who took out two storage scrolls from her pouch and went over to Hanata and presented them to her at the council table. What are in the scrolls? asked Hanata as she looked at the two scrolls the Yugito held out to her. The first one has the body of your deceased uncle Hugo Hizashi, so that your clan can give him the proper hero's burial that her deserves, while the other is a large sum of money as compensation to your clan. For the death of your uncle and although it does not truly make amends for the loss of a member of you clan it is the best that I can offer, spoke the rakage. Hanata took the scroll and nodded her thanks to the rakage and even gave him a small smile of thanks as well. Since she knew how much this would mean to Neji, where he could finally lay his father remains next to his mother's, allowing him to rest in peace and also finally put the event behind him. Sunid, Jiraiya and the council, who had all been watching the event, could not help but be surprised with what the rakage had done. Since this was the first time ever that a cage had openly apologized for a deceitful event that their village had arranged, since most cages would deny their village's involvement or fault and try and put the blame on the other. Much like what the Yondime Rakage did when Kumo's sinister plan to capture Hanata was revealed. Sunid and the others then took this as a good sign that new Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance would ally themselves with Kanoa and Suna against Orokimaru and his allies. After the Rakage had presented his peace offering to Hanata, Sunid began the alliance talks with the Rakage. Unfortunately for Sunid and the council for the next two hours negotiations with the Rakage did not go as well as they had hoped. As the Rakage turned down any offer that Kanoa made in return for the alliance, as he stated that their offers of trades, goods and other things were not enough to justify getting his village as well as the other shinobi villages of the Heavenly Alliance, involved in Kanoa's and Suna's war against Orokimaru and his allies. I'm sorry Hokage-san but that is simply not good enough as we can already get such things from several other member nations of the Heavenly Alliance, said the Rakage after hearing Sunid next offer. Then perhaps something else in exchange, such as our village, helping you to improve the curriculum of your ninja academy. So to improve the quality of your shinobis coming out of it, like we did with Sunagaku Hidden Sand offered Yakumo. An intriguing offer Kurama-san, but upon the end of our civil war my sensei Juj Liang and myself, helped set up a new ninja academy and curriculum there and we believe it will work well for us, spoke the rakage as he gestured over to Juj Liang when he mentioned him. Then perhaps we could help improve your medical program and hospital, as Kanoa has the finest medics in all of the elemental continent, thanks to the Hokage Sama, spoke Abaraim Shibi. That would be indeed an interesting proposition, spoke the Rakage, but unfortunately, we already have an excellent one and we have you to thank for that Hokage San. What do you mean by that? replied a confused Sunid. Ah, well you see, we already have someone to run our medical program and hospital and her skill easily rivals yours Hokage San, replied the Rakage. Impossible, who else on earth could rival Sunid Sama's skill as a medic, the only ones who could possible could, a Shizun San, Sakura San and maybe even Hanata Sama, spoke Hojo Akira. Her name would be Unahana Ritsu, spoke the Rakage with a smile behind his mask as he saw the shock looked on Sunid's face. Impossible, Ritsu never had any interest in joining a shinobi village, said the shocked Hokage. Ah. Well you see Hokage San, you would find that I can be quite the negotiator when I need to be as I made her several offers that she couldn't refuse. Where in return for joining my village I would make her head of new Kumo hospitals and of its medical nin unit and I would have no control over it and the duties of her staff and she could run it as she saw fit as well as giving her a few other things. I also allowed her to create her own combat medical ninja unit, which as your shinobis can verify from the Battle of Wave they are highly skilled thanks to her training program.
She even adopted your idea of having medical ninjas to be assigned to every ninja squad, which has proven equally effective, spoke the Reikage. Hokage Sama, who is this Ritsu san? asked Anoiki. Ritsu was a young girl who I met, who was a highly gifted healer. I met her on my travels with Shizune, when she found out who I was, she pleaded with me to train her, where she followed me for days on end after I refused her until I agreed to which I eventually did. For about three years I trained her in medical ninjutsu and only medical ninjutsu as she was only interested in healing. After I had trained her in all I could she then left to learn more in healing ninjutsu and to help people, spoke Sunid. This of course did not settle well with the council, as new Kumo now had a healer that rivaled Sunid. Reikage san, if I may, surely you can see that regardless of what we can offer you in return for joining us in an alliance, it would benefit your village and the Heavenly Alliance as well. As the Heavenly Alliance that you formed with the other Shinobi nations and non-Shinobi nations is a great power. A power that Orokimaru and his coalition would feel threatened, given your advanced military technology and weaponry, as well as the number of skilled Shinobis you have under your command along with your own powers and abilities as well as other things. They would also be especially threatened given the fact that you attacked Kiri forces twice, the first being the attack on the hold and the second being Kiri's invasion of Nami no Kuni, spoke Sunid. As she hoped that she could reason to the Rakage, and make him see it would be in his villages and the Heavenly Alliance's, best interest to join forces with Kanoa and Suna in their war against that Orokimaru and his coalition. I do not think that they will attack Hokage san, as Kumo and Iwa have not waged war with one another since the first great shinobi world war and have not fought one another since then, since we never had to. Also as for Kusa and Oto we have never fought them or had any hostilities with them and the Hanya clan hates your village not mine. As for Kiri they are not a threat to my village or the heavenly alliance as the god I Mizukage knows his village stands no chance by itself, replied the Rakage. But that could very well change quickly as considering your recent event in Nami no Kuni, the god I Mizukage could use it as an excuse to get Orokimaru and the other members of his coalition to declare war on you and the Heavenly Alliance, replied Shikaku. True, but doubtful, as the only real thing that is holding this coalition that Orokimaru has created, is that the Iwa and Hanya clan hate your village and Kiri and Kusa are just eager to increase their own power and influence by destroying your village. Hence two possible events will happen, one is that you, sooner along with the Tsuchigamo clan will win your war against Orokimaru and his allies, thereby eliminating the supposed threat to my village and the Heavenly Alliance. While the other is that Orokimaru and his allies destroy you and defeat your allies, after which I believe they will then break their alliance with one another. Where they will no doubt start fighting amongst themselves over who takes your place as the top shinobi village. But even if they keep their alliance together and prepare to attack the Heavenly Alliance it will be many years before they will be able to even try. Since their military strength, will no doubt be severely weakened from destroying your village and defeating your allies, and if they do attack. I and my fellow shinobi leaders of the Heavenly Alliance along with certain allies will be more than prepared for such an attack by them if it should come, replied the Rakage confidently. But Rakage Denka, would it not make more sense to take them down now when you have us to help you and your alliance and overwhelm them, with our combined strength before they threaten your village and your alliance? It would benefit your village if you did that, suggested Koharu. Don't not make it sound like you're trying to do my village or the Heavenly Alliance a favor by trying to have this alliance, Koharu-san, spoke the Rakage in an annoyed tone as he narrowed his eyes. I'm well aware that your village along with Suna are on the verge of losing this war as you are severely outnumbered and are low on funds, supplies and nearly everything else and your shinobi's morally is low. As they're well aware that chances of Kanoa winning this war are low despite the minor victories you have had in the skirmishes with that Orokimaru and his allied forces. You need my village and the Heavenly Alliance far more than we need you, as I can see the desperation on many of your faces, spoke the Rakage which made the council and Sunid very worried as to how he knew all this especially the condition of their forces. But Rakage Denka surely you can see the benefits of forming an alliance with us not only to counter Orokimaru and his allies' forces, but as a force to stand up to all the shinobi nations in the world together, even if just your village alone that allies with us. Together our two villages along with Suna would be so powerful that no force in the elemental continent would be able to stand up to us. As your village is the most advanced of the five great shinobi nations in technology and weaponry and it has three Jinchurikis, and Suna's Kazekage is also a Jinchuriki and Kanoa is the strongest of the five great shinobi nations, spoke Ashikaga Shin. 
HMPH, if you ask me Kanoa is no longer the strongest, as the desperation you are showing right now to have us ally with you, clearly shows that you are weak and need us to save your skins. Your feeble attempts to get us on your side are almost laughable if they weren't so pathetic and obvious. As is your continued arrogances and deluded belief that you are the strongest shinobi village, spoke Yugito, as she scoffed at the desperation of some of the council members, not to mention their idiocy. How dare you speak to us like that you demon whore, abominations like you should know their place and show their betters the respect they deserve and cried Ashikaga Shin in outrage, but before he could finish a sudden massive burst of killing intent erupted in the room. The killing intent was so powerful that it was felt by everyone in the village and made everyone feel as if they had been stabbed by an invisible blade and felt an uncontrollable sense of fear and dread unlikely anything any of them ever felt before. It was even worse for those in the Hockage Tower and in the council room as it felt as if gravity had just increased tenfold, as they fell to the ground unable to move out of pure fear and struggled to even breath from pure terror, as they watched their own gruesome bloody deaths. Sooner, Jiraiya and council were the worst off out of everyone to be affected from the killing intent, as they were in the room with the Rakage, who was the source of the killing intent. Jiraiya was on his knees struggling to breathe while Sunid was barely able to keep in her seat and from falling onto the ground and had to hold onto the council table to keep herself upright. The Anbu commander and some of clan heads were also in a similar state as Sunid, where they had to hold onto the council table to keep themselves sitting upright. While some like Choza, Yakumo, Shikaku, Hana and Anoiki, were unable to and fell onto the ground panting heavily as they struggled to breathe and tried to ignore the visions of the gruesome demise. Shibi's Kikaichu were so terrified that they would not even move and three Heimaru brothers lay on the ground whimper like crazy with their paws over their eyes from fear, hoping that the killing intent would fade. His killing intent it's inhuman, thought Su in panic like, as she struggled to breathe and tired to stand up, but could not as her body was paralyzed from sheer terror of the killing intent. What kind of monster is he, she thought with fear, as she never felt killing intent of this magnitude in her life before, and her fear of the rakage only magnified further, when she saw the rakage eyes glow bright blue and literally saw lightning sparking out of them. His killing intent, it's even stronger than it was before, at Nami no Kuni, thought Sasuke with disbelief and some fear as he struggled to keep sitting up and breathing, as the killing intent he was feeling now was a hundred times worse than it was at Nami no Kuni. Although as bad as it was for those in the room the shinobi elders and the civilian members of the council were taking it much worse due to the elder ages made it harder for them to resist the killing intent, while the civilians were inexperienced to even try and resist such things. They all felt as if their hearts were going to pop out of their chests from beating so fast from the sheer terror of the killing intent or at the very least they would have a heart attack. It was made all the worse for them as they struggled to breathe from the sheer suffocating effects of the killing intent. It was then that the rakage rose his hand up and stretched it out to Ashikaga Shin and then snarled out angrily, Unadoku, wind choke, a. Eh? When he said this the remaining air that Ashikaga Shin had in his lungs was sucked out and he could not breathe any more air in, within seconds Shin grabbed his own throat and he began hold on to it. As he tried to breathe, it made it seem to the others as if the rakage was choking the life out of Shin by using some kind of invisible force. Yugito, you must calm him down before he loses complete control of himself and kills the fool, you're the only one that can calm him down, said Zhu Liang. As he struggled to keep himself standing up from the killing intent along with Killer B and the others. Yugito nodded and went over to the rakage as quickly as she could to him, under the strain of the rakage killing intent, where she then stood next to him and put her hand on his arm, which caused him to turn his head slightly to look at her while still choking Shin with his unadoku. That's enough, said Yugito as she looked directly at him in eyes, telling him to stop. For a moment or so the rakage seemed like he would not, but thankfully he did, where he released Shin from the jutsu allowing the idiot to breathe again, after which the killing intent died down and Yugito began to whisper in the rakage's ear to help calm him down. After a minute or so once everyone in the room could breathe calmly again, soon after the council room door burst open, with the rakage's storm nin guards coming in with their katanas draw and were followed by the Kanoa group that waited with them outside the room. Fortunately before things could escalate Zhu Liang quickly calmed down the storm nins and told them to stand down and that everything was okay and to wait back outside the room. Where soon it did the same and told the remainder of the Kanoa 11 and the other Kanoa nins to stand down and wait back outside the room. Once they left the rakage then turned his head to face Shin and glared at him coldly, which made the already shaken man about ready to wet himself. 
After a moment of just glaring coldly at Shin, the rakage spoke in a cold and deadly tone of voice that made many shiver slightly, if you value your life council member, I suggest from now on, you never call Yugito-chan that in front of me again. For if you do I promise, you will regret the moment you ever uttered those words, as I will not stand by and let you insult one of my wives in front of me. WW wife said Homaru in disbelief, to which the rakage nodded and glared slightly at everyone daring any of them to insult Yugito, which they wisely did not. Everyone in the room was naturally shocked at this news, as none of them would have guessed that the rakage had a wife, let alone that his wife was his bodyguard and a jinchuriki to boot. Once soon it got over her shock and surprise she began to curse her rotten luck at how the talks were turning out so horribly wrong, she then began to slightly curse Shin for being such an idiot. Damn you Ashikaga, you blundering fool, dot are you trying to start a war between new Kumo and us, by insulting the Rakage's wife, wars have been started for far less, she thought angrily as she glared at him. It seems that Kanoa has still yet to evolve past its blind ignorance towards Jinchurikis even despite the fact that they already banished their own and suffered dearly for it. It makes one wonder how a village founded by such noble men like Senju Hashirama and Senju Tobarama, became filled with such decadent, blind, ignorant and bigotry fools, not to mention how the Kazekage Gara can stand working with you, said the rakage in an angry tone. Before he calmed down again, when Yugito placed her hand on his shoulder to calm him down again. This of course outraged and angered many in the council at having themselves and their village insulted in such a manner, but fortunately before this could spiral out of control and get worse. Soon it intervened and tried to do damage control. Rakage san please, I apologize for council member Ashikaga comment towards your wife. So please accept my apologies and assurance that it will never happen again, spoke Sunid and gave Shin a look that told him to keep his mouth shut from now on. Very well Hokage san I accept, but I do suggest you keep better control of your advisors or else something unpleasant will happen to them, spoke the rakage. As he gave Shin one finally glare, where the man audibly gulped and rubbed his neck as the memory of what just happened minutes ago was still fresh on his mind. Deciding to try and change the subject from what happened, Shikaku spoke up, excuse me rakage denka, but as troublesome as it is to ask, you said, wives, as in you have more than one. Yes I do, he replied simply. Does that mean you have a bloodline? Asked Konohamaru, as that was the only way for a person to have more than one wife, since if they had bloodline that was in danger of dying out and a village wished to keep it alive. Then the village would then enact the Clan Restoration Act, which all villages with bloodlines have, which would allow a person with a bloodline to have more than one wife. Sasuke was a prime example of this act as he was offered it due to being the last remaining Uchiha alive in the village, and the only person who could continue the Uchiha Sharingan bloodline. But funny enough Sasuke was too focused on his revenge against his brother right now, to even care about trying to restore his clan. That is partially correct, replied the rakage simply again. Partially, asked Homura, I have two bloodlines, said the rakage, shocking everyone, as a person with two bloodlines was extremely rare, as often enough when two different bloodlines mix together. They would often cause the child in the mother's womb to die or from birth or even be born deformed, as the bloodlines could not mix properly or in other cases, the child would simply be born with one of the bloodlines or even none at all. And may we ask what are your bloodlines, asked Danzo as he wanted to know exactly the rakage was capable of. The rakage of course knew why the old warhawk was asking and sneered slightly behind his mask, as he had planned for all this, after which he then began to speak. My first bloodline is called Shinju Kokai, body renewal, it is a newly formed bloodline that has recently come out, where I'm the first one to have it. The Shinju Kokai allows me to survive any otherwise normally fatal damage and instantly heal from the damage. It also allows me to be extraordinarily resistant to diseases, drugs, and toxins where they are virtually useless against me, as I would recover from them quickly enough. This of course utterly shocked and stunned Sunid and the council after hearing this, as from the description it sounded a great deal like Sunid's Sozo Saisei creation rebirth without the negative effects. Impossible, stated Koharu is shock, there is no possible way that such a limit exists. Very well, let me give you a small demonstration, replied the rakage where he brought out a kunai, and rolled the sleeve of his right arm up and sliced deeply into it. Several people among the council winced at the sight slightly. However, they soon gasped in surprise as right in front of their eyes, the cut rapidly began to heal itself and soon not even a scar was visible. 
Everybody was looking at the man dumbfounded. Many like Koharu could still not believe what they had just seen. Incredible, Sunid gasped, as a bloodline of that kind was a gift from the gods to medics and healers, as the medical capabilities were unlimited. Since there wouldn't be a disease, virus, drug, or toxin that she couldn't cure with something like that helping her. She was also beginning to think, that this was one of the main reasons why Ritsu joined New Kumo, since Sunid was positive she knew about the Reikage's healing bloodline and its usage for medics. Of course, after seeing this many on the council grew gravely concerned, especially Danzo as a bloodline that allows its wielder to survive virtually any fatally damaging attacks and instantly heal from the damage, as well as allow him to be resistant to diseases, drugs, and toxins, made him a serious threat to Kanoa. Especially in couple of decades when the Reikage has enough children who have the Shinju Kokai bloodline to fully become a clan and have grown up, as they would become a major threat to Kanoa and him. A most impressive demonstration, Reikage Denka, spoke Abaram Shibi. As he too was amazed at what he saw, after which he spoke again, but what is your other bloodline? At this question the Reikage smirked behind his mask as he was going to enjoy the looks on certain people faces when he told them. My second bloodline is a very old bloodline that belonged to my clan and has only recently been revived in me, as the bloodline was thought to have gone extinct long before the founding of the great shinobi nations. Although my clan still continued to exist in obscurity for many years later, but eventually they dwindled down in numbers, till only I was left spoke the rakage and then continued. I would not be surprised if many of you have not heard of it, since as I said it is a very old one. But I'm certain that at least some of you have heard of it from stories and legends of old about it and my clan, the bloodline to which I speak of is called the Ranba Car Limit, Stormbreaker Limit, spoke the Rakage. Where the moment the Rakage finished saying his second bloodline's name the elder clan heads members Shikaku, Choza, Anoiki went pale white, Shibi glasses even slide down slightly from the shock as all of them had heard of the stories of that ancient bloodline from the grandparents when they were kids themselves. Sunid, Jiraiya and the shinobi elders were completely dumbstruck to say the very least and could not say anything from the shock. Meanwhile the younger clan heads, Hana, Sasuke, Hinata, Yakumo and Konohamaru along with the Anbu commander and the civilian council members, looked confused as they had never heard of this bloodline before. They were even further confused at the look of fear on Sunid's face and the faces some of the other council members. Jiraiya was the first to get out of his shock, that impossible, he exclaimed, that clan was said to have died out well over a hundred years ago. The pivotal word is, was said, and as I said after the loss of my clan's bloodline, we lived in obscurity, in case any of our remaining enemies tried to take advantage of our vulnerable state and wipe our clan out. As revenge for the crushing defeats we gave them, replied the rakage. Okay, can someone please tell me what you are all talking about, cried Konohamaru as none of this was making any sense to him, what the hell is this Ranba car limit and why are you all so worried? The other members of the council also nodded their heads in agreement as they all wanted to know as well, hence Sunid decided to answer after she got over her shock. The Ranba car limit is an ancient and extremely powerful bloodline that existed before the founding of the great shinobi nations, just as the Rakage said. The name of the clan with this bloodline has long been lost as the clan kept their name hidden as well as the location of the clan's hidden fortress, for fear of their enemies all converging on them all at once on their home. Since even though they were very powerful, they were small in numbers and had many enemies who feared them for the powerful bloodline, hence secrecy was one of the key things to their survival. But even though most people did not know the clan's real name, they were given a name based on their bloodline so that people could identify them and know what they were capable of. And what was this name that they were called, asked Hannah. They were called the Stormcaller's clan, replied Sunid. The Stormcaller clan, said Sasuke Outload, surely they can't be that powerful if we have never heard of them and they lost their bloodline, he scoffed. If you think that Uchiha-san then you're greatly mistaken, the only reason my clan was never as well known around the elemental continent. As your clan or the Senju clan, was because my ancestors were wise enough to know that if they let the world know who they really were and what they were truly capable. Then they would have been attacked by countless clans and enemies all at once. For just as the Hokage said, they all feared my clan's bloodline power, so even if they were to fight off and defeat all those clans it would have been a Pyrrhic victory at best as our clan would have been destroyed in the resulting battle. Since my clan were a small clan and had limited numbers and few of them had fully mastered the Ranba car limit, as it is a difficult limit to master, replied the Rakage. 
And what exactly does your bloodline do? asked the Anbu commander. I believe perhaps your Hokage should answer that one Anbu-san, said the Rakage, where he turned his head to look at her, to which Sunid sighed and answered knowing the reaction of those who were unaware of the Stormcaller's Ranba Car bloodline limit. The Ranba Car is a special bloodline that gave the Stormcaller's clan three elemental affinities, which were wind, lightning and water. The bloodline allowed the members to have unsurpassable control and mastery of their elemental affinity, although most members only could control one or two and were unable to master and control the third affinity. Hence for example, those in the clan that had a water affinity would have had a mastery over it to rival the Nadaim Hokage, while those with lightning would have an affinity in lightning that would have rivaled the Yondaim Rakage. But the true extent of the bloodline was the ability to master and control all three affinities and combine them, which was something only the main branch members of the clan were said to be able to do. Where once they had mastered and controlled all three affinities and combined them correctly, they would possess a psionic ability to control all forms of weather over vast areas, where they could create tidal waves, hurricanes, thunderstorms, blizzards and many other things, spoke Sunid with concern. As even though this answered how the Rakage was able to do the things he was able to do, it made her even more worried about New Kumo. Where if the Rakage succeed in rebuilding his clan in New Kumo and it grew into large enough numbers and he was able to train his children to use their bloodline correctly, if they received it and combined that with his other bloodline then New Kumo and the Rakage's clan would be unstoppable in a few decades' time. When the younger clan's heads and the Anbu commander heard this they could not believe that such a powerful bloodline existed, the civilian council member were now even more scared and concerned about the rakage. While some were scheming about if they could somehow arrange for one of the daughters to marry into the rakage's clan so to improve their social status. Others were even thinking how Kanoa could find some way to get the rakage's bloodlines into Kanoa and strengthen it with them. You have been well informed about some of the abilities of my clan's bloodline Hokage San but you are mistake about one thing, replied the Rakage. And what would that be? asked Sunid as she narrowed her eyes slightly, as she had a feeling that she wasn't going to like what she was about to hear. My clan bloodline is not just any bloodline it is a transcended bloodline, he replied shocking nearly everyone in the room again. That impossible, as powerful as you bloodline is, it cannot be a transcended bloodline the only official transcended bloodline is the Rinnegan and even then that bloodline is just a myth, said Koharu. I'm afraid it is transcended bloodline, council member Utatane, as my bloodline affects the forces of nature itself and harshnesses them to assist me. Not to mention the fact that my Ranba Kar bloodline helped to create other bloodlines. Since my clan is the progenitor of the Seiwa clan who wielded the Hyoten ice release bloodline limit, the Yotsuki clan who currently wield the Rantan storm release bloodline limit and the Amako clan 2 who wielded the Karenga Sandaparusu crying thunder pulse 3 bloodline limit. All three clans are descendants of groups of branch members from my clan, who broke away from it, after they mastered their certain affinities to such a level, where two of them were able to combine the two affinities to create Hyoten and Rantan. While the third group mastered their one affinity to such a level that they were able to do lightning jutsu far beyond normal limits and mastery, said the Rakage. Upon hearing this many could not help but agree with the Rakage reasoning, especially since it had been rumored for many years that the Yotsuki clan, Amako clan and the Seiwa clan were descendants of the Stormcaller's clan, but had never been proven until now. Which made them all the more nervous about it, since those that had heard about the Ranba Kar bloodline knew the legends of its power but they still did not exactly know the full extent of the bloodline abilities and separate what was fact and what was fiction, since all they knew was that he could control the weather to a certain extent. Meaning they did not know how far his control over it extended and how well he mastered his bloodline and what else the bloodline could do and could not do from different the stories they heard about it. But as concerned as they were all about the rakage abilities and his bloodlines none were more concerned than Danzo. As when he learned about the Rakage's two bloodlines, as it made the Rakage the greatest possible threat to Kanoa's safety, since Uchiha Madara revolt against the Shodime Hokage and the Kyubi's attack. After much muttering from the council of what they had just learned in the past few minutes, the Rakage spoke again. Hokage san, if I may, could we call and adjourn to the talks for a short while, since I do not think I'm in the right frame of mind for having talks for an alliance with your village. After the incident with council member Ashikaga and my wife Yugitio and I think it might be best if we had some time to refresh ourselves, spoke the Rakage as he glared at said man, who in turn withered under it. Yes of course, Rakage san, we shall have a recess and restart them in two hours time, spoke Suand. 
as she was relieved to have a respite and try and regain hold of this situation and try and sort out this mess, not to mention have a talk with Ashikaga Shin over how not to insult a cage's wife. Several minutes later in the Kanoa streets after the treaty talks went into recess the Rakage decided to take a walk around the village so that he could fully calm down and to finish what he came here to do. As he walked down the street with his escort party of storm nins along with the rest of his group, he could see the open stares of the people, looking at him in wonder, just as they did when he first arrived and like before he and his group ignored them. He also sensed several Anbu and Root Ninjas following him, which did not surprise him in the very least, as he hardly expects Sunid or Danzo to let him roam around the village without watching him and his party carefully. They had made that mistake before with the Kumo Head Ninja and they weren't going to make that same mistake again. As they walked on, the Rakage and his party met Neji, who had been looking for them, who then went to the Rakage and bowed to him and even thanked him for returning his father's body so that he could be properly buried next to his mother. After a few minutes of walking through Kanoa, the Rakage and his group came across Ichiraku Ramen Bar and decided to have lunch there. The Storm's Nins quickly positioned themselves around Ramen Bar when the Rakage and the others sat at the bar. When the Rakage and his group sat at the bar, Tuki the Ramen Chief nearly dropped a large pot full of hot water onto the ground when he turned around to see who was sitting at his stand. While his daughter Ayami, who was at the back getting some more ingredients dropped the things she was carry and gasped in shock. Quickly both Ayami and Tuki bowed in respect to the foreign cage, after which Tuki spoke, Rakage Denka, to what do we own this honor of having you at our humble stand? Please, spoke the Rakage as he raised his hand to tell that there was no need to bow. There is no need to be so formal, as I'm just a simple customer and I came here for a simple meal. As I have heard many great things about you famed ramen from a former rival of yours Tuki San, who odes by the name Hakaku for. At the mention of Hakaku, Tuki narrowed his eyes as he never forgave Hakaku for trying to kidnap his daughter in hopes of getting the secret recipe of his new Uzumaki Supreme Ramen special. And how is Hakaku? asked Tuki with growing suspicion. I'm afraid he left Kaminari no Kuni about a year ago to set up shop elsewhere as it seemed that most people didn't like his ramen, replied the Rakage, which caused Tuki to smile. So Rakage Denka what would you and your companions like? asked Tuki. For a minute or two the Rakage and the other all looked at the menus that were on the bar stand, after which Yugito ordered a ramen shrimp, Killabi ordered a ramen chicken, Mitsuhide ordered a miso ramen, Sayuri ordered a shio ramen, Juj Liang ordered a shoyu ramen. While the Rakage ordered 20 bowls of the Uzumaki Supreme Ramen special, which of course caused Killabi to chuckle, the Rakage's wife Yugito to smack her forehead out of embarrassment and annoyance and the Rakage's three senseis to shake their heads and smile. But when Tuki and Ayami heard this they were shocked as the only person they knew that could eat that much ramen was Naruto, since even the Akamaiki clan members could only eat about 18 bowls of the Uzumaki Supreme Ramen special. Once they heard him they asked if he was sure about his order to which he nodded, after which both Tuki and Ayami went to make the Kumo party orders. As Ayami and Tuki were making the ramen orders, the Rakage looked around the stand and saw the picture of Naruto. After which he then spoke to Ayami and Tuki. If I'm not very much mistaken that is the young Jinchuriki, Uzumaki Naruto, I'm surprised that they a picture of him in your stand like that, since he was banished from this village when he was accused of being a threat to it and spoke the rakage until he was interrupted by Ayami. Naruto was not a threat to anyone, he was a kind, loving and gentle boy who was a loyal shinobi to this village and loved this village despite everything they did to him. The only reason he was banished was because of those blind bigotry fools on the council and the rest of the idiots in here who saw him as a demon just because he had the QB inside him, he was like a little brother to me and I won't let you say th, cried Ayami angrily before she was stopped by her father who then turned to the rakage. Rakage Denka, please forgive my daughter, she just gets very emotional whenever Naruto is mentioned here as he was very close to us and his death hurts us both deeply. Especially since the villagers here tried to celebrate his death when it was announced and shush, said Tuki before the rakage raised his hand to stop Tuki for apologizing and then spoke. There is no need to apologize Tuki-san as I can understand how your daughter feels and if I did sound like I was insulting him I apologize as that was not what I met. I was only making a statement that was all, as I'm well aware of the type of person Uzumaki Naruto was as he was a hero to several key members to the Heavenly Alliance such as Yuki Haru no Kuni, Snow, Spring Country. 
Takagakur, Hidden Waterfall, as well as our newest candidate to join the Heavenly Alliance Nami no Kuni, Wave Country, and all of them regard him as a hero to them and I have heard much about him from the leader of Takagakur Shibuki and from Lady Daimyokuyuki and I'm glad to see that there are at least some people who regard him as a hero here, spoke the Rakage. After which they continued to speak for a while, as Ayami and Tuki cooked the ramen, where once they were done the rakage and the others continued to speak for a while as they ate their ramen and then paid for their meals and left the stand. After their meal the rakage and his escorts went to his personal airship and spent the next remaining hour there until they left the airship and headed back to the council room. In the council room after the two hours recess the Kanoa council was reformed in the council room and ready to begin the treaty talks again. Sunid had also made certain that the civilian members of the council, or more specifically Ashikagashin, kept their mouths shut during the talks and to only speak when they had something useful to say, with the threat of having them interrogated by both Anko and Ibiki as well as by Ino and Yakumo for a month. Soon after everyone had entered the council room, the rakage and his party arrived, but unfortunately the rakage was not in the best on moods when he entered the council room or to be more precise. He looked furious, judging by the way he stormed into the council room with a furious look in his eyes, as that was the only part of his face they could see thanks to the mask he wore. I did not think it was possible Hokage san, that I could be even angrier with your village than I was when council member Ashikaga insulted my wife. But after what you and your village has just done now I'm absolutely appalled with you and your village, spoke the Rakage furiously. Rakage san what are you talking about? asked the confused Hokage, as she began to worry that some fool in the village had insulted the Rakage or a member of his escort. You know very well what I speaking about Hokage San, spoke the furious Cage. Rakage San, please I assure you, I do not know what you are talking about, replied the confused female Cage. Then do you care to tell me about these? spoke the Rakage angrily, where he then opened up a storage scroll that he had been carrying, where he bit his finger and spread his blood over some seals causing a puff of smoke to appear. After which when the smoke dissipated eight bodies appeared on the floor next to the Rakage in a pile, four of them were dressed as Oto Nins, while the other four were dressed as Iwa Nins. Rakage San what is the meaning of this, cried Koharu in outrage of the Rakage bringing dead bodies into the council room and declaring that they, the council, were being deceitful of something. But as Koharu was shouting angrily a concerned look appeared on Danzo's normally passive face, realizing what must have happened to his agents. I should be the one asking that you detain San, snarled the rakage angrily, and as to why a squad of Kanoa shinobis had crossed into our country's borders again. As well as into the territories of one of the founding members of the Heavenly Alliance, Takagakur Hidden Waterfall, where they tried to kidnap shinobis belonging to both my village and Takis. You can naturally imagine my shock and outrage when these were sent to me by Takagakur and my people at New Kumo after they caught them. Rakage Denkai that is an outrageous claim, as those shinobis clearly are of Awagakur, Hidden Stone, and Otogakur, Hidden Sound, how can you even say that they are Kanoa shinobis, when they are clearly not, spoke Danzo. Where he tried to steer the accusation away from himself and Kanoa and pin it on Orokimaru and his allies. I know that they are Kanoa shinobis because of this. Said the rakage as he lifted one of the dead, Iwanin's, bodies up and opened his mouth to reveal a hexagram-shaped seal on his tongue. This seal is a cursed seal that is used by, your. Root Division Danzo-san, although it prevented us and Takagakur from interrogating and getting information from them. This seal on them still proves that they belong to your Root Division as your agents are the only ones who use and have these seals placed on them. Upon seeing this seal every one of the council turned to look at Danzo who narrowed his one visible eye, when he realized that his plan had failed miserably. Where he began to silently curse his agents for being caught and failing in their mission as well as wonder how his plan could have failed. D-A-N-Z-O. You son of a bitch cursed Sunid inside her mind and she began to curse the old war hawk to the lowest pits of hell for what he'd done and swore to make him pay dearly for this as he had most likely just destroyed any chance they had in an alliance with New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance, as well as very likely started a war between Kanoa and the Heavenly Alliance. This is the third time that Kanoa has sent its shinobis into Kaminari no Kuni in an attempt to spy and gather information on my village. The first time we sent your shinobis back with a warning not to do so again, but you did it again when you sent Jiraiya the Toad Sage into Kaminari no Kuni. I was even willing to let that go, considering the position your village is in, in this war. But this time I will not, especially when you used such a deceitful and underhanded attempt by calling us here for an alliance. 
while at the same time send your shinobis to try and kidnap my shinobis as well as my allies' shinobis, and trick us into siding with you in your war. Hence from now on any attempted by your village shinobis in entering into Kaminari no Kuni or our village illegally or any other heavenly alliance member will be met with deadly force and your shinobis will be sent back in bodies bags, spoke the furious cage and then continued on. And it is because of this act, that I must end these talks as I will not ally my village nor have the heavenly alliance ally itself with a village that tries to use us for their own means and has no sense of honor. Reikage san please reconsider, as I assure you that Danzo acted without my orders or knowledge and acted on his own accord and he will be punished for it I promise, spoke Sunid as she glared angrily at Danzo, who just ignored her. I'm afraid that will not do as I have said I cannot have the heavenly alliance or my village ally with a village that we cannot trust and even if I believed you in having no knowledge of Danzo actions. How can I trust you as an ally when you cannot control your own subordinates, not to mention your village has nothing to offer my village or the heavenly alliance, which would be worth sending many of our finest shinobis to fight in a war that never involved us from the start. Where many of them will die in the it and I will not send my shinobis or the shinobis of the other members of the heavenly alliance into a war that will result in many of them dying needlessly, spoke the rakage and continued on. And although I have more than enough reason to declare war on your village for this deceitful act, my village will not declare war on you as we do not wish to take sides in this war and will remain neutral, so you should consider yourselves lucky, said the rakage with a slight growl. Even despite the loss of the possible alliance with the Heavenly Alliance, many on the council were relieved to hear that the Heavenly Alliance would not declare war on them after Danzo's act. Thank you Rakage san but please we see a, spoke Sunid but was interrupted by the Rakage. I sorry Hokage san but there can be no alliance between us, but I wish you luck in your war, good day, spoke the Rakage and then left the room with the rest of his party leaving Sunid and the council by themselves. After the rakage and his party left the council room, they quickly headed to the top of the Hockage Monument, to board his airship, where the crew had just finished preparations for the airship to launch. But just as the rakage was about to board, Sunid, Jiraiya and several Anbu appeared on the Hockage Monument to try and keep the talks alive. But sadly from and the rakage refused again, where he boarded the airship with the rest of his people and once he was aboard the airship rose up above the village and flew away. Aboard the rakage's personal airship after the boarding the airship, the rakage went up to the bridge of the ship and looked over Kanoa as they flew over it and away from it. Once they fully left the village behind, four bolt nins entered the bridge and bowed to the rakage, these bolt nins were the same bolt nins that had sneaked off the airship after the rakage left it to have the talks with Sunid and the councils. Were you able to get what I asked for? asked the rakage. Hi Rakage Sama, here is one of the files that you asked for and the rest of them are in this scroll, said the leader of the Bolt group. Who wore a yellow and black snake mask and who handed the Rakage a file and then a scroll containing the rest of the files that his team got. Excellent work all of you, spoke the Rakage as began to read the file that he was given. As he read the file he suddenly found something that caught his interest and raised an eyebrow to it, well now I have to say I never expected that, who would have thought that. After a few minutes of reading he then told the crew on the bridge that he was going to his room and left. The rakage room a few minutes after enter his room and after taking off his tradition cage robes and hat and the rakage began to read some of the files that the shock nins borrowed from Kanoa, soon enough the rakage heard a knock on his door and told the person to enter. After which Yugito entered the room and closed the door behind her. Yes Yugito-chan is there something wrong? asked the rakage. Funny I was about to ask you the same question, replied Yugito which got a raised eyebrow from her husband. Come on, I know you well enough to know that even before that fool on the council opened his big mouth, that you weren't happy being here, hell I almost feel the repulsion coming off you when we neared the village, said Yugito. It's all in the past, replied the rakage shortly and continued to read the file he had in his hand. Is it, asked Yugito, look. I know it was hard on you being here, but you got to remember to let go of those bad memories as holding on to them will only cause you more pain. You told me that back when we first met and you also said that once we let go of our past mistakes we should look towards making a better future and that what we're doing, remember, said Yugito. At this the rakage let out a sigh of exhaustion and then smiled, after which he put down the file he was reading and went over to Yugito and titled down a little and kissed her on the forehead. What would I do without you and the others to talk so sense into me when I need it, said the rakage with a smile. 
probably get yourself into more dangerous situations and get yourself killed, replied Yugito Smirk, which caused the Rakage to laugh and agree with her. After a minute or two Yugito decided to ask the Rakage some things that she had been wondering for a while and upon asking if it was okay to ask some question, Yugito asked them. Well I was just wondering why is it that you had me tell the Kanoa Nins about the Zanzo, after image, and more importantly tell them the basic about how you do your Ripo, lightning steps. Not to mention why you had Okatsu tell the Kanoa Nins about the seal and how it blocks Dojutsu abilities and how we have it placed on all our shinobis and all the shinobi members of the alliance. Well the reason why I had you tell about the Zanzo is the technique is not all that important or top secret, since if you remember the technique can often be accidentally rediscovered. As Guy and Lee both can use it in a small way thanks to their many years of Taijutsu training, as only people that have taken a similar type of physical training as those two have, can ever hope to master the Zanzo. Besides even if the Uchiha and Hitaki use their Sharingans to somehow copy it neither of them could use it much or for very long as their bodies would be unable to handle the stress that the technique takes on the user's body, replied the Rakage. As for the Ripo lightning steps, well you forget that to be able to use the technique a person would need to be able to continually draw voltage from the geomagnetic voltage of the earth or the static electricity from the air itself. To do that would be practically impossible for any ordinary lightning affinity user to do, and as you know even the most skilled and high affinity lightning user can only draw and shape raw naturally lightning during a lightning storm, when the air is full with static electricity from the storm. Besides even if Danzo or the others there are somehow able to find a way for a person to draw all that energy from either the air or the earth, then said person would be still unable to both continually draw and control all that raw energy at once, hence the person would be literally cooked to death from the inside out. The only way for a person to be able to naturally do that without any harm is me, thanks to my bloodline as I'm able to absorb and channel naturally raw lightning or chakra based lightning without doing harm to my body. Hence the only way for anyone else to be able to do it is if they have the Sutomi Breaker limit and have fully master it, replied the Rakage with a smirk. So basically if Kanoa tries to recreate it, they will waste time and resources and manpower to do a technique that no one without your bloodline can do, said Yugito with a smile. Realizing the Rakage's plan to have Kanoa waste their time and focus on a technique none of their shinobis can ever use. Correct and although I'm unsure about Sunid I have no doubt Danzo will try, dot and fail, to recreate my Ripo to use it himself, said the Rakage with a smirk at the thought. But still what about the seal? asked Yugito. Ah. Well that is linked to me getting Kanoa to have these talks and to get out of them when the Bolt teams got what I wanted, you see I knew that once Kanoa found out that I had created a seal that can block the Dujutsu's abilities then they would be desperate to have us ally with them where they would invite me to have talks with them in hopes of forming an alliance, where I could then enter Kanoa and sneak an infiltration team with us without setting off warning alarms, from when we cross the special barrier around Kanoa. That warns Kanoa's barrier team detection division of intruders trying to pass through the barrier to try and enter the village. Where the infiltration team could then get the information I wanted without trouble while I kept Kanoa ruling body busy with the talks and their security would be focused outward and around the airship instead of other areas. Also I knew that once Danzo found out about the seal, he would send some of his root agents to try and kidnap some of our shinobis that patrol the border. As well as some of the other alliance member shinobis in hopes of getting the seal and breaking it down so to find a way to bypass the seal effects, spoke the rakage. But what if he had waited till after we allied with them? Asked Yugito. Not a chance Danzo knew there might be a chance that the talks might not go well which was why he had his men disguised as Iwa and Oto ninjas in the hope of tricking us to side with Kanoa in the war. Also as well Danzo is smart enough to know that if we did ally with them we would guard the seal on our shinobis carefully, hence the way he tried it was probably the best way to get to analyze the seal without causing an incident with us, which in the end it did anyhow. As I had extra shinobis lying in wait for his men and ambush them when they attacked one of our patrols and I had Shibuki do the same in Taki with his shinobis, where we then captured both teams. Where I then had Juj Liang Sensei break the seal on their tongues and had Masato, 5, interrogate them for all the information on Root and on Danzo although it wasn't as much as I had hoped as the bastard is tight lip about everything that Root does and only tells his men the basic of what they need to know. But still once Masato got all he could from them I had Sensei put the seals back and then had them killed right before I left for Kanoa, so that they could not tell Danzo what we had learned and that we could break his seal on his agents. 
hence the dead bodies gave me exactly the excuse I needed to get out of the talks and put Kanoa in a bad light at the same time, replied the rakage. But still what you did was a big risk, what if they had got away and captured one of our people with the seal and brought it back to Kanoa, they could have analyzed it and found a way to negate its abilities, said Yugito. It wouldn't have mattered if they did, replied the rakage, where he continued when he saw the confused look on Yugito's face. Even if they had captured one of our people with the seal they would be unable to break it down without a key. You see I knew the strong chance that if someone like Jiraiya saw the seal, they would capture one of our people and analyze the seal and break it down to find an way to negate its ability on Dujutsus. So I designed a special key to the seal, which acts like a cipher key where without this key there would be no way to break down and understand the workings of the seal. Even someone like Jiraiya would be unable to break down the seal without this key and it is only known by a very small number of select people which includes Juj Liang Sensei and myself, said the rakage. Yugito nodded in understanding as she had to admit the rakage had thought about practically everything, but there was still something that she was still wondering. Okay I can understand that, but what about revealing your bloodlines, I thought you would want that to be kept secret for a little while longer, spoke Yugito. Unfortunately I could not as I needed to reveal it so keep Orokimaru and his allies from involving us in the war and attacking us. Which was also the same reason why I brought Mitsuhide Sensei, Sayuri Sensei, Juge Liang Sensei with me, replied the rakage and continue when he saw the confused look on Yugito's face. You see recently Masato informed me that Orokimaru has several spies in Kanoa and I'm certain that, what happened in the meeting will be told to Orokimaru and in turn he will tell his allies. This of course confused Yugito further until the rakage explained further why he revealed his bloodlines, once he did Yugito understood why he did it. I guess that makes sense, but what do we do now? She asked. We wait, as it is their mood now, he replied, before he looked over the file he had been just ready and looked at her. Yugito. I want to say that I'm sorry, sorry for what? I'm sorry for losing control of myself back there it's just that when he called you that name, it's just that it brought back a lot of bad memories and I hated anyone calling you or any of the others something like that. Besides I know how much you hate being treated like some weak helpless girl who can't stand up for herself and needs a man to do it for her, spoke the rakage. At this Yugito smiled at him, it's all right, I understand we all lose control of ourselves every now and again, Besides the idiot had it coming and if I had done anything to him it would have just caused you trouble. Besides I like a man who can take charge every now and again and stand up for his wife even when she doesn't need him to. At this the rakage smiled at his wife understand and nodded his thanks, before he then signed and stretched stiffly and sorely. Tired? Asked Yugito. Yeah, the past few days have been hard and not to mention things are only going to get more stressful, in the near future, he replied. Well then, you should take a break and relax a little, you're no good to anyone when you're tired and stressed out, she said. I can't I need to look over and sort all these files, before we arrive back in New Kumo, spoke the rakage. Well you can leave them till later as it will take a few days before we get there, said Yuigto as she put her hand over the files and keeping the rakage from picking up another file. Now you may be the rakage and leader of the village as well as the leader of the Heavenly Alliance, but I'm your wife and I'm the one in charge of you, so you will take of your coat and lay on the bunk bed. Where I can give you a massage and help you relax for a little while, as you earned it after dealing with those fools there. At first the rakage tried to argue, saying he had too much work to do, but Yugito would hear none of it and ordered him get on the bed. After which the rakage just sighed as he knew he couldn't win, as Yugito along with all his other wives were all like that. Since it seemed he was always attracted to strong willful women who could always stand up to him despite who he was and put him in his place or slap some sense into him when he needed to be. Hence he could never win an argument with any of them, which was why he gave up trying to and just did what he was told. Once he was laying on his stomach on the bunk bed, Yugito sat on his back and began to give him a massage, to help him to relax a little and loosen the knots on his back and shoulders. As she did this Yugito could hear her husband groan as he left his muscles loosen and relax, this continued for 10 minutes, until the rakage suddenly turned around and grabbed hold of Yugito and turned her around so that he was on top of her with her arms pinned over her head. What do you think you are doing? asked Yugito in surprise, where the rakage kissed her deeply. 
After which, when the kiss ended, Yugito was left slightly dazed for a second or two, until the rakage spoke, well, you did say you like a man who can take charge every now and again and besides, you said I need to relax a little and I can't think of anything more to relax me than being with my wife, spoke the rakage with a smile. Where he then kissed her deeply again, where this time Yugito kissed back just as deeply and even opened up her mouth so that they could play with each other tongues. During the kiss the rakage activated several security seals he had placed in the room so that no one could hear the groaning, moaning and giggling that would come out of his room for the next few hours. Two weeks later in a hidden underground location. Currently sitting in their underground meeting room Orokimaru and his allies were discussing Kiri's failed invasion of Nami no Kuni. Thanks to the rakage and his forces intervention, but if you want to be more precise the meeting was mainly listening to the god I Mizukid Shiro yells of angry and fury, about new Kumo and the heavenly alliance and the rakage who Shiro was mainly cursing. When Shiro heard what happened to Rajuta along with his forces from the ninja named Sanji that the rakage let go to deliver his message, he was furious beyond words where he literally destroyed his office along with most of the Mizukid tower in a fit of rage. Fortunately No was killed during the Shiro's fit of rage as they had all quickly ran out of the tower when they felt his killing intent. But even as annoyed as some of the other leaders were about Shiro shouting and yelling, most of them did agree with him now, since the rakage and the heavenly alliance was a threat to them that needed to be dealt with. Once Shiro had finally stopped shouting about how they should forget Kanoa and Suna and attack New Kumo and the heavenly alliance, the Yondaim Suchikij Ryoku spoke up. As much as I hate to say this I agree with Shiro, the Rakage and the Heavenly Alliance are becoming a threat to us. As their interference with the invasion of Nami no Kuni has ruined our chances to open a new front against Kanoa, and spreading their forces out more to make our operation easier when it begins. If we do not do something about them soon now they could cause us more trouble. Is there any chance that we could send a new and larger force to try and take the country? Asked leader of Kusugaku Doku. No. Growled Shiro as he clenched his fist in anger, New Kumo has sent a full battle group of ships and has stationed an entire shinobi division there, and are already fortifying themselves in it. By the time we can organize a new invasion forces, the New Kumo shinobis will be fully dung in. Where they would be nearly impossible to push out and that is not counting that New Kumo and the rest of the alliance will send reinforcements to help and drive our forces back. I agree with Ryoku about New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance being a threat, but I believe that we should wait till after we have destroyed Kanoa and dealt with Suna, once they're out of the way we can deal with the Heavenly Alliance in our own time, spoke the leader of the Hanya clan Shinran. No, yelled Shiro, as he slammed him fist down at the table they were all sitting around, if we don't do something soon about them now. Then we will be giving them the opportunity they need to either attack us or prepare defenses to stop any kind of attack we make against them but we cannot change our plans against Kanoa when we're so close to finishing them, even with the failed invasion of Nami no Kuni and opening up the new front. We can easily change the plans so that we can still meet the scheduled date for the operation and go ahead with it, spoke Shinran. Besides why should we attack New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance? Not counting your forces neither New Kumo nor the Heavenly Alliance has ever made any kind of attack on us. The only reason they attacked your forces at the hold was because you captured the future queen of Suki no Kuni, Moon Country, who is an ally to the Heavenly Alliance. Also the reason they defended Nami no Kuni is because they asked to be members of the Heavenly Alliance and because you would threaten to cut off the trade at sea. Since with Nami no Kuni under your control you and the Mizu Daimyo would control trade in the Central Elemental Sea and thereby cutting trade off with their allies in the South which was true. Besides that the Heavenly Alliance has stated that they are neutral in the war and will not take sides in it, spoke the leader of Kusugaku Doku. Do you seriously believe all that tripe he said in the letter he sent, cried Shiro angrily. No I don't, but I still don't see the point of giving Kanoa and Suna a major new ally that could help them, right when we have them on the ropes as it is and we are so close to winning this war, spoke Doku. That may be true, but they are still a threat to us and they could attack us when Kanoa is destroyed and we are weakened from all the fighting, where they would take advantage of us, spoke Ryoku. I believe that we should leave New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance alone or at least for now, until we have dealt with Kanoa after which we can then concentrate on the Heavenly Alliance and deal with them. Since as Shinran-kun said, we have come too far and too close to destroying Kanoa to get distracted by something else, spoke Orokimaru. What? Cried Shiro in anger, Orokimaru you can't be seriously, have you not been listening to what we have been saying, 
considering what they have done lately they could be allied to Kanoa for all we know. I have to concur, the Heavenly Alliance actions, both at the Hold and at Nami no Kuni, suggest that. They could be also using their so-called neutrality to get us to turn our backs on them so that they can attack us when we are off guard, spoke Ryoku. I understand what you are saying gentlemen, spoke Orokimaru smoothly, but as Doku-kun has said there is no point in giving Kanoa and Suna a new ally to help them in the war. Once we have Kanoa and Suna out of the way we can deal with the Heavenly Alliance as we planned in our own time and as for Ryoku-kun belief that new Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance being secretly allied with Kanoa. I can assure you that neither new Kumo nor the Heavenly Alliance is allied with Kanoa. And how can you be so sure of that Orokimaru? asked Shiro with a sneer, as he did not believe the snake Sanon and wanted to make new Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance pay in blood for his humiliating defeat and the death rage to his most loyal supporter. Simply Shiro-kun, spoke Orokimaru with his traditional snaky smile, Kanoa has already tried to get an alliance with them. What? cried Shiro, while the other members of Orokimaru's coalition turned their head to look at Orokimaru, as they wanted answers to this new information. It seems that about two weeks ago my former teammate Sunid sent the Rakage a petition to try and form an alliance with the Heavenly Alliance. Then we need to act now and attack the Heavenly Alliance before they coordinate a joint strike with Kanoa and Suna against us cried Ryoku furiously. There will be no need Ryoku kun as the Heavenly Alliance has rejected the alliance after the Rakage visit Kanoa for talks spoke Orokimaru with a smile. But you said Kanoa was a forming an alliance with the Heavenly Alliance said Doku. I said that they tried to form an alliance with the Heavenly Alliance, replied Orokimaru smoothly. The talks failed due to two certain incidents, one being a civilian council member who insulted the Rakage's wife. Who was also his bodyguard and is the Jinchuriki of Nibi no Baitnako, two-tailed monster cat. The Rakage married a Jinchuriki, asked Shiro in surprise, to which Orokimaru nodded. As even he was slightly surprised by the information, but then again it wasn't that unexpected. As it was an unspoken tradition among the shinobi nations that the bijus would be sealed into, the family of the village's own cage. So to ensure that Jinchurikis not only had strong ties of loyalty to village and their leader, but they also served to show off the cage's might and it prevented the Jinchuriki from turning traitor on the village. Hence marring a Jinchuriki was not completely unorthodox for the tradition as it achieved the same goals as just placing it into a family member of the ruling cage. The other reason as to why the talks failed was because seemly, Shimura Danzo the leader of Kanoa's root division sent in two teams of his agents to infiltrate Taki no Kuni and Kaminari no Kuni to try and capture shinobis belonging to the respected villages. He also had them disguised as shinobis from Awagakur and my village so that if someone saw what happened, the Heavenly Alliance would blame us and they would side with them in the war. But fortunately for us, Danzo plan failed and his men were caught and identified by Kumo's and Taki forces, spoke Orokimaru. But why would Danzo have his men try and capture shinobis from Takagakur and new Kumo's, as there must be something you're not telling us Orokimaru. Since the Rakage would not believe we would risk war with him just to capture some of their shinobis, spoke Shinran. A-A-A-A-A-A-H-H-H-H-H, that's quite correct Shinran-kun, the reason why Danzo tried to capture shinobis from new Kumogakur and Takagakur is because the Rakage has created a special seal that blocks the abilities of Dujutsus on people. Such as blocking the Sharingan's ability to copy Jutsus and the Byakugan's ability to see the chakra circulation system inside another's body. He has also placed the seal on all his shinobis and all the shinobis of the other village that are members of the Heavenly Alliance. Hence you can see how useful such a seal would be to us in our war with Kanoa, which would be why it would not have been hard for new Kumo to believe that we did try to get our hands on the seal had Danzo plan worked, spoke Orokimaru. When the other leaders of the coalition heard this they had naturally been shocked to hear about a seal that could basically make Dujutsu useless and how it had been created by the Rakage. Orokimaru himself had to admit that he himself was just as shocked as they were, when he first heard about the seal, after which his respect for the Rakage's skill grew, as he doubted even his former teammate Jiraiya nor his prize pupil the Yondaim Hokage could have done it. Although he was still a little angry at the Rakage for creating the seal as it would make things very difficult when he finally got Sasuke as his new body and gained the Sharingan, where the seal would keep him from learning all of the world's jutsu. After getting over their shock both Shiro and Ryoku started to shout about how they should try and kidnap some shinobis from some of the other shinobi nations that were part of the Heavenly Alliance. 
but their shouting eventually ended when Orokimaru, told them that if they tried they would fail just like Danzo men and it would have the Heavenly Alliance turn on them, which was something that they wanted to avoid right now. Although Shiro did mention that he would be more than happy send his men disguised as Kanoa nins in Kaminari no Kuni and grab some Kumo nins to analyze the seal. Although after saying that Orokimaru informed him that should he do that he would most likely fail, since if the same trick didn't work for Danzo it wouldn't work for him and also told him that New Kumo and the Heavy Alliance would declare war on Kiri if he did. In which case Kiri would stand alone as he would not help Kiri, both Doku and Shinran agreed as they weren't going to support Shiro in his thirst for revenge and ruin their chance of destroying Kanoa. Even Ryoku agreed, for even though believed the Heavenly Alliance was a threat, he wasn't going to let the best chance he had in destroying Kanoa and finally getting his revenge on it slip past his fingers. After hearing this Shiro relented knowing his forces would stand no chance in defeating the combined forces of the Heavenly Alliance by themselves. Once that matter was settled Doku spoke up, so will New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance declare war on Kanoa after what happened at the talks there with the Rakage. Unfortunately no, they will not, replied Orokimaru. Why is that? asked Ryoku. I believe it is because the Rakage knows that Kanoa is already on the verge of losing the war and doesn't see the point in attacking and destroying it when we will do it for him, answered Orokimaru. This caused several of them to mummer around the table, as it did make sense, after the murmuring ended. Orokimaru then went on to explain what his spies told him about Jirai's near capture by new Kumo shop nins and the fact that Kumo had been destroyed and rebuilt in a new hidden location. When the other leaders of the coalition heard this, many of them grew concerned to the fact that new Kumo shop nins were skilled enough to nearly capture Jirai the Toad Sage, the strongest of the Senen. Orokimaru himself had been impressed with the trap they laid and had Jirai not lucked out he would have been surely captured by the shop nins. He also made a note that should he ever come into conflict with a group of shop nins, he would not underestimate them. Orokimaru then went on to explain what his spies told him about what Jiraiya had learned when in Kaminari no Kuni. When Shiro learned that the Ning clan had joined New Kumo he had been furious with the news and swore revenge on the clan for being traitors. Ryoku had also became concerned when he heard that the Kisaragi clan and the Wengi clan had joined New Kumo as he had fought both clans before in the Third Great Shinobi World War and both were powerful enemies to have. But when Orokimaru mentioned the Tatara clan still existing and was with New Kumo now, the other leaders' concerns evaluated even higher as they all knew of the powerful clan as well as their powerful bloodline the Cotent Steel release. Orokimaru himself was greatly intrigued when he heard that the Tatara clan still existed, as he knew of their Koten well and where it could easily rival the abilities of his former subordinate Kimimaro and his clan the Kaguya. Plus the idea of gaining a body with the Koten bloodline or having the chance to examine and experiment on someone with it, greatly appealed to Orokimaru. But as interesting as that was to him, the news about the Yuki clan and the Ishida clan and how their bloodlines were artificially created by the Godaim Rakage scientists interested him far more. The idea of doing such a thing had often appealed to Orokimaru, but all his attempts had failed, where he then gave up and went on to different projects. But yet the Godaim Rakage scientists had succeeded and Orokimaru had to applaud to their brilliance, but at the same time be greatly angered as he did not like to be upstaged by anyone. When Orokimaru told the other leaders of this, their reaction was very much like to how Kanoa's council was to the news where there was much shouting about how they should send men to infiltrate New Kumo and gain the information on how the bloodlines were created. Shiro himself was so angered by the news that he even stated that the Yuki clan and the Ishida clan were even bigger freaks than natural bloodline holders as they were at least were natural, while Yuki clan and the Ishida clan were created in a lab. Fortunately Orokimaru was able to calm them all down, where he explained how Jirai stated that the research was destroyed by the Rakage and was backed up to the fact that only a few Kumo shinobis showed the abilities of those bloodlines. The news did calm the other leaders down a bit but they were still concerned with the news that there were now two new clans in New Kumo with two new powerful bloodlines. Orokimaru of course left out the information he learned about the Rakage Raipo as he had claimed to try and recreate the technique himself. Since the idea of having a technique that rivaled the Yundime Hokage Horation no Jutsu Flying Thunder God technique greatly appealed to him. He also had to admit he had enjoyed the look on Ryoku face when he first heard the Jutsu was described and how similar it was in speed to the Yondime Hokage's Horation no Jutsu. Where when he heard of the Reikage's Jutsus, Ryoku face changed from pale white with a stunned look on it, 
to bright red and a look of absolute rage and hate on it, which no doubt showed Ryoku's fear and hatred of the deceased Hokage and anything remotely similar to him. Once the other leaders of the coalition had fully settled down again, Orokimaru told them what happened during the talks in Kanoa with the Rakage. When Shiro learned that both Mitsuhide and Sayuri had joined New Kumo and were the senseis of the rakage, he went ballistic and started to scream and shout curses and swore he would make them both pay dearly for being both traitors and for training his worst enemy. After a few minutes Shiro started to calm down a bit, but he still mumbled about the different way he would kill Mitsuhide and Sayuri and make them suffer for their transgressions. When Shiro had finally calmed down, Orokimaru then went on to explain that Juj Liang the legendary Namoriru, the sleeping dragon who was also with New Kumo and was another one of the Rakage senseis. This made Doku and Shinran extremely nervous and it got Shiro and Ryoku slightly worried at this news, as Juj Liang's reputation was well known to them all. Even Orokimaru was concerned when he first heard this as he knew how dangerous an enemy Juj Liang was and if he trained the rakage then it explained one of the reasons as to why the rakage was so strong. But as worrying as this news was to the other leaders, it paled to when Orokimaru told them of the rakage 2 bloodlines or to be more precise when he told them about the Ranba Car limit, Stormbreaker limit. Upon hearing this Shiro went pale white with fear as the Ranba Car bloodline was the most sought after and most feared bloodline in all of Kirigaku or Hidden Mist. Since from the founding of Kirigakur, most of the pervious Mazukages spent years searching for any descendants of the main branch of the Stormcaller's clan, in the hope of rebuilding the clan in Kiri S, the pervious Mazukages believed that with it, Kiri would be unstoppable. The Yondai Mazukage Yagura also spent a great deal of time searching for the bloodline as he feared the bloodline greatly and wanted to make sure that the bloodline would never emerge. Shiro himself feared it as well, but had believed until now that the bloodlines along with clan were now extinct. Impossible. That bloodline is only a myth, cried Ryoku in disbelief. I'm afraid it is true Ryoku-kun, especially if you consider the rakage abilities that he has shown when he destroyed the Kiri and Mizu no Kuni armada four years ago and the fleet in Nami no Kuni, spoke Orokimaru. Who unlike the rest of his allies was not terribly worried, he was actually excited. Since not only was the rakage the wielder of one of the oldest and most powerful bloodlines to exist, but was also a dual bloodline holder with a completely new and powerful bloodline. Where together they made for a near-perfect vessel for him, Orokimaru only wished he had learned of this sooner, where he could have planned a way to possess his body. Quickly pushing that thought aside for now Orokimaru decided to regain his allies' attention and have them focus on their new plans for destroying Kanoa. For the next hour or so they talked about what they were going to do, after which once they had finished the plans they adjourned the meeting until a fortnight from now, where they would finalize everything and sort any last-minute details. Once that was sorted all the leaders of this coalition left to return to their respect villages or bases. An hour later in another room of the underground complex. Sitting on his throne, Orokimaru was reading the rest of the report to what his spies in Kanoa told him about what Jiraiya had learned about New Kumo, the Heavenly Alliance and the Rakage. Although there was not much more to the report that he did not know already, there were still some interesting things he learned, one of them being that the Rakage was not native to Kumo or Kaminari no Kuni. Which both surprised and impressed Orokimaru greatly as he knew what the odds were in such a thing happening. Soon after finishing reading the report, Kabuto entered the room, you asked for me Orokimaru-sama. Yes I did Kabuto, I have a mission for you, spoke Orokimaru. And if I may ask what is the mission? Replied Kabuto. I want you to negotiate an alliance for me between us and the Heavenly Alliance or more importantly between us and New Kumo, said Orokimaru surprising Kabuto slightly. After which Orokimaru then went on to explain how upon first hearing of the event of Nami no Kuni and the Jiraiya failed infiltration mission, along with the failed talks in Kanoa, Orokimaru sent his own letter in the hopes of gaining an alliance with the Heavenly Alliance. He then went on to explain that just before his meeting with the Mizukij, Suchikij and the other leaders of his coalition, he received a reply stating that the Rakage will meet him to discuss a possible alliance in a few days' time in a neutral location in the Ishi no Kuni, Stone Country, which was neutral between their forces and the Heavenly Alliance. If I may ask Orokimaru-sama, why don't you go there yourself, since surely the meeting would go better there if you were there? Asked Kabuto. Ah well, dot you see as you no doubt remember my reputation is not held in the highest regards when meeting with other leaders of villages. Considering how I killed that weakling fool the Yondime Kazekage and took his place during our first attempt to destroy Kanoa. 
where if I go there myself the rakage will be on guard and expect something to happen, hence he will not be in a negotiating mood, not to mention Jiraiya may hear about it and Kanoa may use the chance to eliminate me, replied Orokimaru. Which Kabuto nodded to as it made sense, especially the fact with Orokimaru reputation in such matters as it took many years of hard effort and negotiating to gather this coalition together against Kanoa. But if I may ask Orokimaru Sama, what would make you think that New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance would be willing to join us against Kanoa and Suna? asked Kabuto. At this, Orokimaru smirked and began to explain what happened in Kanoa during the talks with the Rakage. After hearing what happened and hearing what Orokimaru planned to offer New Kumo, Kabuto had to admit it could work, considering what happened there, not to mention what Orokimaru was offering them in return for helping them. Interesting purposely Orokimaru Sama, but what about Kiri or more specifically Shiro, as I don't believe he will be too thrilled with the idea of allying with the Rakage and his forces, spoke Kabuto. True but he can be easily dealt with, much like the Yondime Kazekage was, replied Orokimaru with a sadistic smirk. Where Kabuto match it with an arrogant like smirk of his own, after which he nodded his head and went up to prepare for the meeting with the Rakage. Son. The library of Benzaiten will be mine along with Al Ayat's knowledge, thought Orokimaru with a smirk and started to chuckle alone in the room. Ten days later currently standing in the middle of a wide open plain surrounded by large standing stones, was Kabuto along with four masked sound ninjas wearing balaclavas and anbu-like armor. These masked shinobis were among Orokimaru's new fighting division to fight Kanoa's anbu and root divisions. They were called Sonic, which stood for strategic. Operations, ninja, intelligence, combat and were basically his version of them as they were highly trained to fight them. Soon enough the rakage dressed in his cage robes and hat along with his face mask appeared with Okatsu and Fu. When Kabuto first saw the rakage he felt the same aura of dominating authoritative power coming from the rakage which he had become infamous for which nearly made everyone submissive to his presence. Both Kabuto and his men had to fight hard to fight the submissive urges they were having from the rakage and to remain ineffective to it. Unfortunately Kabuto men were unable to hide their intimidated of the man as their body language showed they were intimidated by him, while Kabuto himself was just able to hide it, but just barely. As the rakage came closer they could also feel the powerful essence about him which people described he had, which made both Kabuto and his men, feel a combination of fear and respect for the rakage, something that Orokimaru himself often strived to have everyone feel when around him. Quickly calming himself down Kabuto then quickly came up to the rakage and bowed respectfully to the man, which was a sincere gesture. As his respect for the cage's skill and power in recent years had earned Kabuto's respect, as he respected power and the rakage had plenty of that. Greetings Rakage Denka it is an honor to finally met you in person, your fame and reputation is known to many in Otogaku including our leader Orokimaru and is well respected and revered. Although I must say finally meeting you in person, shows that the stories I have heard about you do not do you justice, spoke Kabuto. For although he knew he was laying it on thick with the compliments, he had learned that often enough continuing praising a ruler power and presence often helped to smooth a ruler over and help him become more negotiable. The rakage simply nodded his thanks for Kabuto comments, not really caring what he was saying, after which he then spoke, I was led to the understanding that Orokimaru himself would be coming here to speak about a possible alliance. My master Orokimaru-sama sends his apologies, but unfortunately he was unable to come here himself, as current matters with the war we are engaged with along with our allies, has left him unable to attend this meeting. Hence he has sent me in his stead and left any negotiations between our respected alliances to me, replied Kabuto. Very well then, but I doubt that your master Orokimaru can offer me anything that would make the heavenly alliance, my village or myself interested in joining you or in making it worthwhile in joining in the war on your side, replied the Rakage. With all due respect Rakage Denkai I believe we can indeed offer you something that Kanoa could not or at least was not willing to, replied Kabuto, which caused the Rakage to raise his eyebrow. Oh, and what exactly could you offer us? Well other than the shared spoils you would get from helping us destroy Kanoa you would also get something that your village has wanted for many years, a Huga clan member, spoke Kabuto, which got another raised eyebrow from the rakage. Since if you'll help us destroy Kanoa you could capture several members of the clan and use them as breeders to create a new Huga clan in your village so that you can finally have the Byakugan. At this suggestion the rakage seemed to think it over and spoke again, a intriguing offer I will admit, but I have to ask, what is the god I Mizukage and your allies' opinion of you trying to form an alliance with the Heavenly Alliance? 
since I highly doubt he would be happy of this. Neither the Godai Mizukid Shiro nor the other members of our coalition knows about this meeting, as we thought it best that that they did not know. Due to recent events in Nami no Kuni would makya them prejudice of such an alliance between us especially the Mizukages. But I'm certain that once you join us and they see how beneficial you and your alliance could be in helping us defeat Kanoa, they will come around, spoke Kabuto. Perhaps, but I highly doubt that the Mizukage would have the same enlightened view as you and your other allies might have. As from what I understand the Mizukage would like nothing more than to use my skull as a drinking cup, replied the Rakage. Perhaps, but I doubt the Mizukage would be much of a problem in the near future, replied Kabuto with a slight smirk. Oh, does that mean that your Orokimaru plans to have the Mizukage replaced with you or one of his other followers just like with what he did to the Yondaim Kazekage, replied Okatsu as she stepped forward. Or better yet simply have a little accident happen to him and have him replace with someone more along Orokimaru's line of thinking, spoke Fu. Of course not, replied Kabuto rather calmly, but per se if something were to happen to him I would think you would be pleased with him gone, since as you stated the Mizukage and yourself are not on friendly terms. Although I will admit I would not shed any tears to see that man dead, why would I wish to join a coalition of nations? Who are lead by a man who would use me and have me killed if it was in his best interest spoke the Rakage. This caused to Kabuto to narrow his eyes, since this was not turning out the way he thought they would. Hence that is why I must decline your offer of an alliance between your coalition and the Heavenly Alliance, regardless of the benefits I may receive later on from allying with you, said the Rakage. Come now Rakage Denka I sure that we can come to some understanding, besides it would be a grave mistake for you to throw away the alliance, a mistake that you would greatly regret in the near future, spoke Kabuto. But upon saying that a small amount of killing intent started to leak from the Rakage, although it was not a lot but still enough to make Kabuto and his men shudder slightly and get them worried. The Rakage's eyes also started to glow bright blue and emanating lightning, making his appearance all the more frightening to them where he then spoke in a dark and dangerous tone of voice. Is that a threat Kabuto-san because I do not like to be threatened and if it is, you will regret it I promise you. N no of course not Rakage Denka, you just misunderstood me, all I meant was that you would regret the chance of finally claiming the Hugo bloodline that is all, said Kabuto slightly nervously. At this the Rakage stopped the killing intent and his eyes stopped glowing and emanating lightning and spoke in a more calm tone of voice. Although it is true that there are some who would like to have the Hugo clans by Akugan in our village, most no longer care. As we have enough bloodline holding clans in it and are no longer interested, spoke the Rakage, causing Kabuto to frown again in failure of his mission. Since that was their best offer to get the Rakage and the Heavenly Alliance to join them. Also, spoke the Rakage in a dangerous tone of voice, gaining Kabuto and his men attention. I want to tell you Orokimaru something for me, tell him that my village has no interest in joining either his forces or Kanoas in this war and we will remain neutral in it, but if for any reason your master and his allies ever threaten the Heavenly Alliance or any of our allies. Said the Rakage where he then did a circular motion with his right arm and cried out by a Kurai white lightning and destroyed a massive standing stone about a hundred feet away from where they were, after which he then turned to Kabuto. I will destroy him, finished the rakage with a snarl and a massive burst of killing intent that caused Kabuto to fall to his knees and start breathing heavily as he saw an image of himself being struck by that attack and making a massive hole in his chest. I I I you understand our rakage Denka, spoke Kabuto as he breathed heavily and pulled himself up. Good. Then I suggest you leave now Kabuto-san, replied the Rakage, to which Kabuto nodded and ordered his men to come, where they quickly left. When they left, Okatsu spoke, do you think that they try anything? Doubtful, or at least not until after they have destroyed Kanoa, since from what they no doubt know now from Orokimaru spy. They will be at least hesitant to try anything against us until they dealt with Konoa first, as they know from both our military power and from what I showed at Nami no Kuni. They know that we are no pushovers and they would pay a heavy price for any attack they could make right now, a price that they cannot afford until Kanoa is out of the way, replied the Rakage. After which he then made a few hand signals and twenty storm nins appeared out of the standing stones showing that they were from the Yuki clan. They were here to help protect the Rakage just in case Orokimaru tried to play the same trick twice, by replacing the Rakage with himself, like he did with the Yondaim Kazekage. After which they gather around the Rakage, where they all started to head home. A four days later back in Orokimaru underground hideout. 
After the event with the wreckage, Kabuto and his team returned back to Orokimaru's underground base and upon hearing what had happened he had not been entirely pleased with how the event turned out. Although he had been interested in how Kabuto described the wreckage to him, but was again disappointed when Kabuto couldn't give him a better description of the wreckage. So the wreckage refused our offer and threatened to wage war on us should we ever attempt anything against them is that correct Kabuto, asked Orokimaru with some disappointment. Hi, Orokimaru-sama, replied Kabuto as he knelt before his master. How disappointing I had hoped to met the man and it would have made my plan so much easier. Not to mention I may have learned the location to the library and gained access to it, once we had established the alliance with them, spoke Orokimaru. At the mention of a library Kabuto became curious, excuse me Orokimaru-sama but what library are you referring to? At this Orokimaru smiled a little and then spoke, tell me Kabuto have you ever heard of the library of Benzaiten? No I have not. Then let me tell you, long ago hundreds of years ago during the age of endless war before the sage of the sixth path spread the great shinobi arts to people. There existed an ancient order called the White Lotus Society made up of scholars and monks trained in an earlier form of the ninja arts before the sage of the sixth paths built the foundation of chakra and founded ninjutsu. Upon seeing the endless amount of lives being lost and the towns, cities along with hundreds of books and scrolls being destroyed the White Lotus Society decided to do something about it. They built a massive library dedicated to collecting and preserving knowledge and began to collect and gather books and scrolls of every kind and even writing and recording great events and things they had seen. They even discovered two separate summoning contracts to help them to collect books and scrolls and bring them back to the great library. They continued to do this for hundreds of years recording, collecting and even in some cases stealing the books and scrolls so to preserve them. They would even write down and describe in detail all the different techniques they'd seen shinobi's plans do, and how they are done and how a person could do them and because of this they were hunted down. For you see when the shinobi clans learned that the White Lotus Society was writing down all their secret techniques that they saw and even stealing scrolls on them in other cases, the shinobi clans decided they could not be allowed to continue to exist and hunted the society members down so to keep their secrets. But even despite all this, the society continued to exist in secret and continued to collect and gather knowledge all over the elemental continent and stored it in the library that they called the Library of Benzaiten, after the Goddess of Knowledge. The society existed even when the great shinobi villages were founded and the kept collecting and gathering knowledge, right up until 50 years ago where the last remaining members of the order were captured and killed by the Shodime Rakage who had tired to get the location of the ancient library out of the members so to use the knowledge they collected to help make his village the strongest of the great five shinobi nations, but unfortunately he failed and the location of the ancient library was lost to the ages. It is even said that even to this day that ancient summons that the White Lotus Society used continued to gather and collect books, scrolls and knowledge all around the elemental continent and protect it from outsiders, finished Orokimaru. Upon hearing all this Kabuto was naturally shocked, as he had no idea that such a place even existed, it was then that suddenly something came popped into his mind. Orokimaru sama are you saying? That the rakage knows the locations of the lost library of Benzaiten, spoke Kabuto in shock. At this Orokimaru smiled, Kakukukuku, you were always the sharp one Kabuto, and to answer your question I believe so. But how do you know? asked Kabuto. Ah. You see several years ago I discovered an ancient scroll in an old ruin, the scroll stated that it was a map to the location of the hidden library, the map itself was a series of riddles and clues that would lead you to the hidden location. After many months of working I was finally able to decipher the riddles and with the help of some maps I learned the location of the library. I found the location of library to be inside a hidden valley in one of the mountain ranges of Kaminari no Kuni in the very northern part of the country, 6, but unfortunately when I found its location the civil war there started, hence I could not go there. But still, why do you think that the Rokodime Rakage knows the location of the lost library when none of his processes found it? asked Kabuto. Ah, well you see it would explain a great deal as to new Kumo new found great strength, for you see from the report we have gotten about new Kumo shinobis, where they have been unusually stronger. They have even shown abilities to do techniques that have not been seen in hundreds of years and as the old saying goes knowledge is power, said Orokimaru, which got a nod of understand from Kabuto. 
It was then at the thought of the library and what it held that Orokimaru's smile grew bigger. Imagine it Kabuto a library with hundreds of years worth of knowledge and where it is said to be the location of the greatest collection of jutsus in the world, enough jutsu that could even quench my trust for knowing jutsus. At this Kabuto nodded his head the idea of all that knowledge was greatly appealing even to him. So what are you going to do about it Orokimaru sama asked Kabuto. We will ignore New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance for now, as they clearly have no wish to enter this war and mostly likely stay out of it, so to see which of us will win. Besides we need to finish off Kanoa and Suna first, but once they have been dealt with we will turn our attention of the Heavenly Alliance. I had originally hoped to use the alliance with them and us to infiltrate New Kumo and learn its new location. As well as even try and find a way to get them to allow me to enter the library, where I could then explore it and the find a way to size it when the time was right to attack and take over New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance. But since that plan has failed we will have to come up with something else, where we would have to take things slowly, said Orokimaru. Upon hearing this Kabuto nodded again, where Orokimaru then told him to come as they were about to meet with the other leaders of coalition to finalize everything as well as their plans to deal with New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance. Once Orokimaru and Kabuto left the room, in the dark shadowy corner of the room a dark figure emerged from it before disappearing right into the walls like a ghost or spectre. Two weeks later currently alone in the middle of the night under a full moon in the ruins of an old forgotten fortress, was Jirai the Toad Sage who was waiting for someone. This person was an unknown informant who had contacted him through his intelligence network, telling him that he had information for Jirai that would be extremely important to Kanoa in its current war with Orokimaru and his allies. For about 15 minutes Jiraiya waited for the contact to arrive, as he waited a dark cloud covered the moon for a moment or two and when the cloud cleared. A tall figure wearing an old tattered crimson red cloak stood before right Jiraiya, causing the old toad hermit to nearly jump in fright as he had never even sensed the man arriving and that was something as Jiraiya's senses were on full alert in case it was a trap like in the old Kumo ruins. Who are you? asked Jiraiya as he steadied his fast betting heart. Who I, am is of no importance Jiraiya-san, but what I have to tell is important and is vital to your village's survival, replied the man. Upon hearing this Jiraiya immediately got serious, so what exactly do you have to tell me, he asked. Orokimaru and his allies are planning a major offensive against your village, where they plan to wipe your village out in one massive attack, spoke the man and shocking Jiraiya. What proof do you have of this claim, asked Jiraiya, since he wasn't sure if he could trust what the man was saying, since he did not know him. This, spoke the man, where he took out a file and threw it to Jiraiya. In that file contains supply covies and where they are headed, as well as the locations of several different camps of the invasion force in Ta no Kuni, rice field country, and Kusa no Kuni, grass country. The file also gives a detailed account of how they're going to attack and when it's going to happen. Jiraiya gave a quick look over the file and upon seeing it, he could tell that if this was true then Kanoa was in grave danger. How do I know that this is true and how do I know that this isn't part of Orokimaru plan, by having you give me misinformation, so that our forces will be out of position and caught off balance when his forces attacks. That is if they do, since none of our scouts have reported any signs of a large gathering of forces along the borders. That is because they are far enough away from you border and hidden well enough so that they cannot be spotted by your forces. But whether you believe me or not Jiraiya-san is of no concern of mine I have given you the information, whether you use it or not is up to you. You can validate the information if you wish through your intelligence network to prove what I'm telling you, is the truth. Fine then I will, although I find it strange that my own informants have not mentioned something like this to me, said Jiraiya as he narrowed his eyes slightly as he still did not trust the man. That is because Orokimaru, set up several decoys and false leads for you to follow and kept you busy from finding out about their plan, replied the man. At this Jiraiya frowned since it did make sense since many of his recent leads about his former teammate and his allies had turned up to be dead ends or simply useless. Okay then if that's true then how do you know all this when I don't and why are you telling me all this, asked Jiraiya as he wanted answers. As to how I know all this, that is none of your concerns, but I will tell you that you are not only person that has a large network of spies, informants and contacts and as for your other question. The reason I'm helping you is to strike back at Orokimaru for what he did to me, replied the man. And what exactly did he do to you, asked Jiraiya. Like he did to so many other people, he ruined my life, replied the man with a hint of anger in his voice. 
For a moment or two there was a pregnant pause, between the two men, where the two of them remained silent, after which the cloaked man then spoke again. I have now given you what I came to give you. It is up to you and your village now to use it. I wish you luck in your fight, said the man. After which he then turned and started to walk away from Jiraiya. Wait, cried Jiraiya, I still have more questions for you, but just as he was about to chase after them cloaked stranger, another dark cloud covered the moon for a moment. Where when cloud passed by and Jiraiya could see again, he saw that the cloaked stranger had disappeared without so much as trace or a sound and could not even sense him. Sighing to himself, Jiraiya quickly decided to head out and confirm some of the things he had learned and what the file mentioned. As he headed out Jiraiya honestly hoped that his contacts would tell him that what the cloaked stranger told him was a lie, for if it was true, the Kanoa was in grave danger and could very likely be destroyed. A few days later in the Hokage's office currently sitting in her office, Sunid was having a meeting with her military advisors, Shikamaru, Shikaku and the Anbu commander over what they should do about the sudden halt in raids by Kusa, Oto forces along their borders and raid along the coast by Kiri forces. They were also currently planning on send a deep recon teams to investigate the unusual behavior of their enemies. Normally Danzo would be among these meetings as would Koharu and Homaru, but ever since the debacle with the rakage the elders' powers began to decline. After the escapade with the rakage, Suna could have used the event to have Danzo executed as a traitor, but unfortunately as much as she hated to admit it she needed Danzo to continue to lead and command his root division, as Kanoa needed all the manpower they could get. But even still she hadn't let Danzo get away for going against her, Sunid was able to use Danzo's disregard for her authority as Hokage and for causing the rakage to cancel the negotiations. To take away a good bit of the elders and the civilians council members power away from them. She was also able to use the event to gain more control over the root division and although she still did not have full control over the division, she could still restrict their movements, where she forbid any root operation to happen without her approval. Hence no root agent could leave the village without her written and signed permission, she also forbid any root agent or team to leave the village without members of her own loyal Anbu to accompany them. She even forced Danzo to give her a complete list of all his root agents, with the names both real and code, their skill level and what abilities they were capable of. This of course severely weakened Danzo's position, not to mention public support for him went downhill as a certain someone Kokortsunadi Kokor, leaked it out to the populace of Kanoa, what Danzo had done. Hence once people heard this, they turned on Danzo, as they blamed him along with Ashikaga Shin for ruining the possible alliance between Kanoa and the Heavenly Alliance. Also at the same time that all this happening, Tuki and his daughter Ayami had decided that to leave Kanoa much to the sadness of Sunid, most of the Kanoa 11 and several others. When asked, Ayami told them that, neither she nor her father could take living in a place where they continue spit and curse Naruto for something that wasn't his fault. Hence they decided to move somewhere else for a fresh start in a new place. Many of course could not blame them for wanting to leave, especially during these times, Sunid herself and said she often pondered the idea of just leaving, but decided against it as she had reason abilities and she wasn't going to run away from them this time. As Sunid and the others discussed their strategies, Jiraiya suddenly burst into the office, through an open window. Jiraiya, what is the meaning of this? cried Sunid angrily as she wasn't in the mood for one of Jiraiya's shenanigans right now. Sorry Haim but I have something that you need to hear now. Spoke Jiraiya urgently. Seeing the seriously look on her former teammate face, Sunid signaled Jiraiya to go ahead, which he did. A few days ago I learned through my intelligence network that someone had information that I would be interested in and how it involved Orokimaru. I then got word to him that I would meet him in an old abandoned fortress outside Otofuku Gai. When he met me, he gave me this file, said Jiraiya showing the file to Sunid and the others. He then told me that Orokimaru and his allies are planning a major offensive against us that would destroy Kanoa and they are just about ready to launch it. What? cried Sunid is shock. Are you certain of this Jiraiya-sama? asked the Anbu commander, to which Jiraiya nodded. I'm positive as I checked some of the things that the man told me about through my own intelligence network and what it says in this file and what he told me checks out. Orokimaru in planning a major attack against us, from what it says in this file, Orokimaru is planning a pincer movement. He and his forces along with the Hanya clan forces, who Orokimaru sneaked into Tarno Kuni, will launch a massive attack from Tarno Kuni. At the same time Kusa forces along with Iwa forces, will launch their own attack from Kusa no Kuni, 
Also at the same time Kiri's fleet will then land with most of Kiri's forces and launch their attack on us from behind. Once the three forces have attacked they will rapidly move forward and overwhelm any forces that we could assemble at the time to try and fight back. After which they would then surround the village to prevent any escape and then attack and destroy the village completely. Impossible, spoke the Anbu commander, how could they plan all this out without us finding out about it? You're forgetting this is Orokimaru we're dealing with here and very little is impossible for him, replied Jiraiya, which the Anbu commander had to reluctantly agree with him on that. Shikaku then asked Jiraiya if he could look at the file detailing Orokimaru plan, where both he and Shikamaru looked over the plan, once they finished Shikaku spoke. Troublesome, Orokimaru has planned this well, with the massive numbers he has assembled combined with surprise and rapid speed along with attacking us on three different fronts at once. He could easily overwhelm us and destroy us within three to four days of launching his attack, before we could even try and reorganize our forces and put up any kind of defense. And what's even more troublesome, spoke Shikamaru, is that Suna couldn't even help us since even if they somehow heard about the attack the moment it happened. Their forces would take up to three days at full speed with little rest stops to get to us, by which time it might be too late and even if they got to us in time they would be too exhausted to fight from racing here to help us. That is probably what Orokimaru planned, so that his attack on us would be easier. How many men will he have to attack? asked Sunid. According to the file that I was given Orokimaru has about 5,000 shinobis and the Hanya clan have about 2,000 shinobis. Both the Hanya clan and Orokimaru have been gathering rogue shinobis, missing nins, shinobi mercenaries and whatever type of shinobis who would be willing to fight for them to build up their numbers and they have been training them for many years. Iwa will be sending about 8,000 shinobis and Kiri will be sending another 5,000 shinobis, altogether they will be sending over 20,000 shinobis against us. That nearly twice our numbers when combined with Suna forces, spoke the Anbu commander worriedly. As at full strength Kanoa had over 7,000 shinobis to call upon and Suna had over 5,000 shinobis, giving the combined strength to be over 12,000 shinobis. Jiraiya do you know when they will attack? asked Sunid. One week from now, spoke Jiraiya. Damn that bastard. That not near enough time to do anything to stop them, cried Suand angrily where she slammed her fist on the table in anger and cracked the table. Sunid knew that they needed at the very least two weeks to inform Suna and have them gather their forces, so that they could link up with Kanoa forces. So that they could then plan and organize an preemptive attack against the forces in Ta no Kuni and Kusa no Kuni and still have time to race to head off the Kiri invasion force. Sunid knew that without Suna's help they stood no chance of making any kind of preemptive attack against Orokimaru and his allies' forces by themselves. As they did not have enough shinobis to send to attack the enemy forces in Ta no Kuni and Kusa no Kuni and to fight off the Kiri forces when they land. Even if they just split their forces in two and attacked the forces in Ta no Kuni and Kusa no Kuni and scattered their forces, by the time they did that. Kiri's forces would have landed and Kanoa's forces would be too weak and exhausted from running and fighting to fight off the Kiri forces. There was even the chance that even if they made a preemptive attack by themselves, Orokimaru and his allies would be prepared for it or he would have scouts, lookouts or spies to look out of any large gatherings of Kanoa's forces along the borders of both countries. So to warn his forces, where they would be prepared for Kanoa's attack and overwhelm them and slaughtered the Kanoa's shinobis. Also even if they sent word to Suna now, they would only arrive when the attack begins and they would be exhausted and would need at least a days or two to rest, by which time Kanoa would be surrounded by the Orokimaru and his allies' forces. So what do we do? asked the Anbu commander. As troublesome as it is we have no choice but to fight the battle here in Kanoa in a defensive battle, replied Shikamaru, where his father nodded in agreement. But if we do that we will be allowing them to surround us, replied the Anbu commander. We have no choice, troublesome, if we face either force in a pitch battle the other two forces will outflank us and attack us from our flank or from behind and they will then slaughter us. Even if Suna could arrive in time to help us, we would have to divide our forces to meet one of the other forces where the third force would still outflank us and destroy us both. Besides dividing our forces when our enemy forces is numerically superior is suicide as they would overwhelm our divided forces and we would still be all slaughtered. Our best chance of winning this battle let alone surviving it is if we fight here in Kanoa when we can fight a defensive battle effectively, replied Shikaku. 
Shikaku is right, spoke Sunid, we have no choice but to fight them here, but if we are, then we going to make Orokimaru and his forces fight forever inch of soil in Kanoa after which she then turned to the Anbu commander. Tiger, I want you to help plan and organize the evacuation of all civilians and non-combatants from the village once I've announced that we are going to be attacked next week to the civilians and our shinobis, which I will be doing this evening. Hi, Hokage Sama, replied the Anbu commander named Tiger, who then shunshined body flicker away. Shikamaru, I want you to send word to Suna informing them of what going to happen here and tell them that we need their help. After which I want you to form a plan to help with the coming battle to increase our odds in winning, spoke Sunid, to which the young Nara muttered, troublesome, but nodded in understanding and left the room. Shikaku, I want you to send word to the Suchigamo clan and tell them to send as many of their shinobis as they can to help. After which I want you to work out what we can do to slow down Orokimaru forces to give Suna time to arrive in time as well as reduce Orokimaru's forces and improve our odds against them, said Suna to which the elder Nara muttered, troublesome, much like his son but still nodded and left the room. Jiraiya, I need you to go out again and try and find out anything else that your contacts might know that could help us and give us a better chance. But I want you back here as soon as possible as we're going to need you here, said Suna. Right Heim, spoke Jiraiya, but just as he was about to shunshun away Suna called out to him, where she told him to be careful, to which the toad sage nodded and said he would, where he then left. Once Sunid was alone she turned around her chair to look out at the village that her grandfather and her great-uncle founded. As she did she should could not help but wonder how many lives would be lost in this coming battle and if Kanoa would survive it as it was now facing the greatest threat to its survival since the Kubi attack. As she thought about the coming battle she could not help but wish for the millionth time that Naruto was alive here and now as he always could give people hope and made victory seem possible regardless of the odds. I wish you were with us here now, Naruto, four days later at the border of Kaminari no Kuni. Currently sitting in the high command seat on the bridge of his personal airship, the rakage was holding out his projection orb in the palm of his hands and was focusing on the people he wished to contact. Soon enough the astral projections of 15 people appeared, to the Reikage's right stood his right-hand man and best friend Seiwa Anasu and with him was Gan Ning the commander of Kumo's fleet. Along with them as well was Admiral Matsumoto the commander of Kaminari no Kuni's fourth battle fleet, as well as the admirals of Cha no Kuni, T country, Umi no Kuni, C country, Suki no Kuni, Moon country, Haru, Yuki no Kuni, Spring, Snow country. Also as well were the leaders of Yukigaku, Hidden Snow, and the Getsugaku, Hidden Moon, and Juge Liang's wife Yue Ying. All of these people were the leaders of different groups of Operation Clean Sweep, which was one of the four parts of Operation Divine Storm. Operation Divine Storm was a major operation that was spilt up into four different and separate operations the first being Operation Raging Thunder, which the Rakage himself was the main leader of. The second was Operation Clean Sweep, the third being Operation Judgment and the and fourth and final being Operation Tidal Wave. The person on the rakage far left was Sun Lee commander of Kumo Submarine Fleet and Underwater Shinobi Fighting Force Aqua, she was leader of Operation Tidal Wave. The people next to Sun Lee were Naomasa e, the son of Naomasa Katsumoto, Lady Daimyo Kicho Sensei and Bodyguard. Lee commanded a samurai division called the Red Devils, who were famed during the Civil War for wearing red crimson armor and cloaks and were said to have fought like devils. Next to Lee was Rukan leader of the Ashida clan and Shibuki leader of Takagaku Hidden Waterfall. These men were the leaders of Operation Judgment. The person in front of the rakage was Sumeru the Yondime Hoskikage, leader of Hoskagaku Hidden Star, who was leading a separate operation from Operation Dive Storm, called Operation Cleansing. Greetings gentlemen. Dot and Lady spoke the rakage, which caused Sunli to smile that the rakage addressed her as should be instead of just saying gentlemen. Now that that we are all here we can begin, are all your forces ready, asked the rakage. Hi rakage Sama, my forces are ready to go, spoke Anasu. My men are also ready to go and will be in position at the scheduled time, spoke Rukan. As will be my own forces, replied the Admiral of Cha no Kuni, where he was followed by the other various different leaders of the different operations. High Rakage Denka my forces are all ready as well and many of my men are eager for some payback against Kiri and Mizu no Kuni for kidnapping Princess Sachi, spoke the Admiral of Umi no Kuni. Very good Admiral and don't worry, you and your men will get it in a few days time, replied the Rakage. Anasu, is Saito and his people ready with things on their end, asked the rakage to Anasu. Hi, 
he reports that Alf other factions have all agreed and are in the designated position and know what they are to do as does Kenshin and his forces, answered Anasu. Nodding, the rakage turned to Shibuki, what about Hanzaki and Mochi? Are they and their people ready? Hi, they are ready to go when we're ready, replied Shibuki. Nodding again the rakage then turned to face all the other leaders, now then, you all know your orders and in a just a few days time Operation Divine Storm will fully commence and you will all begin your separate operations at the designated time, so good luck to all of you. Hi, said all the other leaders together, after which their astral projections faded away. After which the rakage turned and spoke to Lu Zun the captain of the rakage personal airship and commander of the air fleet of Kumo and Kaminari no Kuni. Captain Lun Zun signal all ships and our ground forces to move out Operation Divine Storm is about to begin, spoke the rakage. Hi, rakage Sama answered Lu Zun and nodded his head in understanding and began to give out orders on his comm channel. So it begins, thought the rakage within minutes of the rakage giving the order to go, a fleet of 20 airships along with the rakage's personal airship leading the fleet rose out of the crater of an extinct volcano. The volcano was near the Kaminari no Kuni border and had been converted into a secret hidden military base for New Kumo. At the same time that the airship fleet was rising up into the air two massive doors disguised as large rocks at the base of the extinct volcano opened up, revealing a large wide entrance way. As soon as the doors opened up a force of well over 2,000 Kumo shinobi started pouring out of the entrance at top shinobi speeds and in tight formations. Once both the airship fleet and the army of shinobis were all out and in formation, the rakage gave the order for all forces to move out. After which the airship fleet and the Kumo force moved forward. New Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance had now officially joined the fourth great shinobi world war and were now on the warpath. Leaving only one question, whose side were they on? N, A, 1. Go to profile to see an image of the rakage's command airship. 2. The clan that the god I'm rakage was from. 3. This bloodline limit belongs to the Amako clan which allows the user to generate the bioelectricity in their body and increase any lightning jutsu they use far beyond the normal limits. It also allows them to naturally be able to use their high lightning affinity to electrically stimulate their nervous system and speed up their neural synapses to react faster to danger and push past their physical prowess. Allowing them to gain tremendous raw speed and power. It also allows them to use, many different high-powered lightning jutsus without any need of hand seals. 4. A cooking nin from one of the anime fillers, 5. Head of Kumo CIND division, go to profile for image of him. 6. Look in the Naruto world map in and if you look at lightning country you see unnamed an asterisk symbol right above the name lightning country. That location is where new Kumo and the library is built, since new Kumo is built where the library is located. Ninja Unit, CIND Anbu Purpose, CIND Iskumogakur's Intelligence Divisions or otherwise known as the Central Intelligence Network Division where they dealt with gathering information and intelligence on all non-alliance members or non-allied countries to the Heavenly Alliance as well as other organizations that may threaten the Heavenly Alliance. They also deal with counterintelligence where if any shinobi village or country tried to infiltrate Kumogakur or the Heavenly Alliance they would find them and deal with them, they would even create false leads or false information for them to follow which would eventually lead those shinobi villages or countries to dead ends or even misjudge the Heavenly Alliance strength and capability. CIND also dealt with torture and interrogation when gathering information from rogue ninjas and enemy spies. Uniform, standard Anbu outfits weapons, standard weapons of any ninja and all carry katanas on their back. Missions, any mission ranks that involves intel gathering or misleading enemy operatives as well as gather information out of enemy spies. Abilities, experts in torture and in interrogation, as well as intel gathering, surveillance, covert ops missions and counterintelligence. Fighting skill level is equal to normal Anbu Shinobi level. History, the CIND division was co-founded the Rokudime Rakage after the Civil War. He created this division so to create an Anbu division that could interrogation of any enemy spies or prisoners and solely focused on gathering intelligence on the activities of all the shinobi and non-shinobi nations, so that New Kumo could one step ahead of their enemies. The division's other founder was Yukai Masato, who trained most of the members of the division and who integrated the intelligence network he had built over his year of traveling, to improve New Kumo's own intelligence network and expanded it. So that they could gather intelligence better as well as keep all the other shinobi nations guessing as to New Kumo's and the Heavenly Alliance's true strength and abilities. Training, 
the CIND division training the basic standard of all ANBU, as the do mainly do covert mission that involve little fight and more stealth and sneaking as well as gathering information. But they are still skilled enough in fighting to hold their own in one and are quite skilled in assassination, as well as being highly skilled in torture and in interrogation, both in physical torture and in interrogation and mental torture and in interrogation. They are highly skilled in misinformation, so that any enemies will come up with false conclusions or guessing about the strength of the Heavenly Alliance and New Kumo. Non-canon Jutsu A. Unadoku, wind choke, this jutsu allows the Reikage to use his high wind affinity to draw out the air out of person lungs and keeping any more from entering them, causing them to choke and die from lack of oxygen. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.